Okay, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. We're going to get started. There are a number of committee members who are out at other hearings on their own bills. So um, there'll be people coming in and out throughout the whole day. Um, and we have 21 bills today and uh, 115 or so witnesses for all of those bills. So um, let me just uh, ask everyone, sponsors and people who come and testify, we obviously want you to be here. We're glad you're here. Um, but uh, we'll have two minutes each. Uh, and uh, we'll just want to keep moving as quickly as we can as we move forward. I'm going to ask Senator Griffith um, to come up first on her 451. And I'll tell you, oh, happy day. It's nice <laughs> to have you back in this room. Uh, make me smile. So. Take it away. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and colleagues. It is wonderful to be back in Senate bud Budget and Tax. I miss you all, and it's great to be in this room, although awkward to be on this side of the room, but it's good to see all of you. I have two bills to present today, and the first of which the chairman mentioned is Senate Bill 451. So I would say, Mr. Chairman and colleagues, I'm pleased to present Senate Bill 451, by way of background, since uh, 2017, there have been multiple efforts to reform the state's procurement system. And this bill is making a modest change to work that we did as a result of the President's Work Group on Equity and Inclusion that Senator Elfrith and others served on. Uh, basically, the mission of the Procurement Council is to maximize transparency, accountability, insight, and trust in state procurement activities. So we did the work in 2019 on the president's work group and we modified the membership of the procurement council. And as a matter of fact, since that time, I've been serving on the procurement council. Uh, recently, we learned that there was an opportunity to add the, um, the state comptroller to the procurement council. Now, right now, the treasurer is already uh, represented on the council and many members of the executive branch. And we thought that it made sense to add the comptroller to the procurement council's important work. In addition, the attorney general um, brought to our attention an amendment. While the procurement improvement council does consider minority business enterprise in our deliberations, it was not explicitly a part of the procurement uh, council's charge. So the amendment that I've offered to the bill as introduced would do that um, at the recommendation of the attorney general. I see that there is a lot of testimony in support of the bill from the uh, agencies that are most impacted. So I'd ask your favorable report on Senate Bill 451. Thank you, Madam Chair. Any questions? Thank you very much. Let's move on to the next one. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chair. If I could call the sponsor panel folks forward. Please, those please of you do. That I've tapped and asked you to come forward. Please join me at the table. You know, there are a lot of people excited about this. There are a lot of people excited about film in Maryland and yeah. not just Prince George's County, but across the state. And this 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 committee has been excited about film in Maryland. Yes. And many way, of you way, are way back, even to some, you know, previous years when yes. other, there was a chair bunch of years ago that was interested that's in that. correct that's correct when i was across the street and many of you including you mr chairman have added your name to this important proposal so i am pleased to present senate bill 452 which really seeks to modernize maryland's film and television tax credit um you know i have written testimony in the folders then i know you all take the time to read that. So I won't read the testimony because we have some phenomenal witnesses that will tell you why the tax credit is so important to the opportunities that we have in Maryland. I would just say that in the time since I started working on film in Maryland and Deb Dorsey will remember this way back uh, when I was a member of the House of Delegates, we, we actually looked at film differently and people consumed media differently. And so we want to modernize the tax credit and make sure that we're covering the types of things that should be covered by this. And we absolutely need more money to be competitive. I think there are at least 40 other states that are offering some kind of incentives. And Maryland, as you all know, is America in miniature. We have everything from the beautiful mountains to the, the farmlands and the waters. And we have some really talented professionals that want to do work here in the state. So by adding resources through Senate Bill 452, 
we can make more film in Maryland. So I'm gonna turn it over to someone that you all probably already know. Uh, we've known her for years. She's with the Maryland Film Industry Coalition and doing a great job, Deb Dorsey. Oh, thank you so much, Senator Griffith. Thank you for introducing this bill and working so hard all these years for the film industry. I'm Debbie Dorsey. I'm with the Maryland Film Industry Coalition. We're an alliance of business and labor leaders and educational institutions and individuals, and we all work together to improve and make Maryland a prime destination for filmmaking. Um, and we are here for full support of Senate Bill 452. It'll create more jobs for crew and our local talent and extras, um, as well as putting a lot of money into many small businesses all around the state. Um, in 2022, Paramount Plus had a series called Lioness that filmed in over nine counties in Maryland. Um, they filmed in Western Maryland, Washington County. They filmed on the Bay in Queen Anne's County. They were in Prince George's County, Montgomery County, Hartford County, Anne Arundel, so everywhere. So this industry does spread out uh, all around uh, Maryland. Um, the program works. The Department of Commerce, um, since 2011, when, when the first legislation passed, $1.2 billion have been uh, spent here in Maryland in creating a, a huge economic impact. Now, we can do a lot more. Georgia, just in one year, in 2022, $4.4 billion. So by increasing this, uh, the annual amount of credits available, we could be doing uh, a lot more here. So Please um, pass this bill at this at all the levels uh, introduced, and thank you all so very much for your time. You guys want to. Thank you so much for allowing me this opportunity to discuss uh, why this bill is really important uh, to me and my company in Maryland. And thank you, Senator Griffith, again, for allowing this opportunity. Uh, my name is Tressa Smallwood, and I am a filmmaker and the owner of Mega My Media. Uh, I live in Maryland, and in 2022 alone, I filmed 12 movies. Uh, I filmed six of those in Maryland. And, but I had to go elsewhere to film the other six because the tax credits did not allow me uh, certain certain abilities to uh, recoup on producers, writers, directors. And so if you take, you know, on average, a film where 500,000 is spent in those categories, well, when you can't get, you know, even 20% back in a tax credit, then obviously that hits my bottom line. So I would love for this bill to get passed, number one, because I would love to stay home and film all of my movies in Maryland. Uh, but also, I think that over the years, we've grown as a film industry. Uh, a lot of the, the people who are here sitting next to me today, we, we talk, we uh, collaborate, and we want to bring more uh, star power here. We want to bring more uh, projects that would actually benefit us all. But in order to do that, we we have to band together and make sure it's a little bit more feasible and compet competitive uh, with uh, some of the other places. Hello, everybody. My name is Jimmy Jenkins. And to the Mr. Chairman and all his colleagues, thank you for having us. This is a very special moment for me. And it's really big because um, I'm 32 years old. And at the age of 19, I decided I wanted to be a filmmaker. And when I looked for resources, I had none in the state of Maryland, but I decided to make a movie with a $3,000 camera. That was terrible. This, <laughs> despite it being terrible, it still created an opportunity for me because there were none in the state of Maryland. I got a job at Tyler Perry Studios in Atlanta. And there was when it hit me that I was working with all these people from Maryland. And I said, man, if y'all just was in Maryland two years ago, I had a $3,000 movie I could have used you on. But they were all in Atlanta because the benefits of it were all in Atlanta. And what I want to say is just a couple of years ago, I did a huge movie with Kevin Durant on a county called Prince George's County called Basketball County in the Water, where I directed and produced. And the film did very, very well. We spent a lot of money on the film in Maryland, and we could not capitalize on it. Kevin Durant decided to do another movie about his childhood. And I talked to him, I said, let's film in Maryland. He said, we can't because we don't have the benefits that Richmond has given us. So they took the entire production of Richmond and it broke my heart. But if Richmond can do it, why can't we? 
why can't we if 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 they can do it and and that's what i wanted to be and uh the biggest thing is i'm not just saying this because it's i'm passionate about it we can look at the seeds and the fruit that have grown from people in maryland there's a little kid 10 years old who just got casted by hbo from Bowie, maryland all he does is play hockey he found out he could act um, some of the top actors in the world and producers are all from Maryland and ask me how many of them live here. Very little. Um, so I'm just hoping that this bill gets passed because I got a big movie I want to film this year and hopefully I can get some tax credits. Thank you. Thank you. That's a tough act to follow. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman Gazon and members of the Senate Budget and Taxation Committee. I'm Catherine Clavana, a full-time actor and voiceover performer. I live in Montgomery County, and I am proud to make my living in the state of Maryland. I currently serve as president of the Washington Mid-Atlantic uh, local of SAG-AFTRA, the Union of Professional Performers. On behalf of our more than 5,000 members, I urge you to pass SB 452. A film or television production generates work for thousands of people who live here, and that means jobs for local actors and also for crew to build the sets, move the gear, transport the cast, it means hotel rooms, rental cars, catering and security details. SB 452 is not a giveaway. It's a rebate on money spent in our state that makes a huge difference in our members' lives. <laughs> actors in Maryland are frustrated with not being able to find more work here and routinely audition for and travel to work in New York, North Carolina, and Atlanta, areas that have more favorable tax incentives. The success of film incentives in Georgia, which has no cap, is well documented. It's the reason you see the Georgia peach at the end of so many films. Raising the annual amount of tax credits for film production here will enable more than one major production to be covered. That's huge. It will allow performers and crews to work at home more frequently and spend the money that they earn from that work here in their home state. And the program stability will make a big difference. Production companies plan in advance and will simply choose another state without assurances that our tax incentives are stable and consistent. For the thousands of taxpayers who are part of the creative community here in Maryland, I urge you to pass SB 452. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chairman. Um, my name is Adrian Wright. I'm also a filmmaker and uh, I work with uh, the Evolve Foundation, which um, we work with young people also. And I think that's one of the things, um, having worked with Tressa as an intern with her, and looking at what some of the young people need in this in this county, um, in PG County and Maryland on a whole, I think that this will enable um, filmmakers and production companies to really pour into our youth. Um, I think one of the biggest benefits of the fact tax film credit is, um, and it's twofold, um, it encourages the growth of the film industry in the state, which improves much needed, um, provides much needed jobs and economic activity. Um, this in turn generates tax revenue that can be allocated to the state toward education. Secondly, it provides opportunity for schools and universities to partner with the film industry in order to benefit the students and faculty. And this could include internships, apprenticeships, educational partnerships that bring students and faculty into direct contact with the film industry and provide valuable experiential learning opportunities. And I think it's very important that we pour back into the youth that helps us build um, the film industry, the film and TV industry in our in our county in um on Maryland, in Maryland on a whole. So um I really believe that if we can expand this, it'll be great for all of the people involved. Thank you. There's more people. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Hello. Hello. How are you? Good. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. I'm Donna Edwards. I'm president of the Maryland State and DC AFL-CIO. 
This is my inaugural uh, committee meeting of this session. So nice to be with you all. Thank you. You have my written testimony. And you also know that there's many tax credits in this committee that we provide uh, testimony on that says we're not doing it well enough. We need to have more transparency, et cetera. This is the most stringent ta business tax credit that we have in Maryland. And it is the most transparent. It is how all tax credits for businesses should go. There is not a single dime given until there is a thorough audit of the books. And this industry lays open its books to the department to go through in order to make sure that all of the investment that Maryland's making does benefit our state. So it is an excellent example of how a business tax credit should be run. The other thing is this is not about one industry. It's not about just the film industry. It is about the hospitality industry and the leisure industry and the vacation industry and bringing in all kinds of uh, businesses that don't normally get to play in the economy. One of the things I like to do on Saturdays is go to secondhand shops or art shops, and they are all throughout our state where I visit and they say, oh, we gave uh, lent some of our um, whatever they, if they're antiques or if they're art to such and such show or to Veep or to House of Cards. And they advertise that to their customers. So this is a win-win for workers, for the economy, for several of our industries, for small business. There is nothing wrong with this tax credit, except it's too small and we have to increase it and move this industry forward. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chair, committee, good afternoon. My name is David O'Farrell. I am the business agent for uh, Mid-Atlantic Studio Mechanics Local 487 of uh, the IATSE. I represent about over 500 technicians that work and reside here in Maryland. Uh, you've heard a lot of good reasons why this bill is important. I'm just going to add a, a little bit of more flavor to it. Uh, shows like Lady in the Lake, which were just here, meant about $12 million in wages that wouldn't have been earned here, and about $3 million in benefits. The show Lioness for Paramount Plus meant about $15 million in wages that were spent here and earned here by Marylanders, and about $5 million in benefits. And when I say benefits, that's health and retirement benefits. Uh, Lioness had upwards of 350 crew working uh, at one time. Uh, we're in the process of uh, working with the major studios and production companies on DEI initiatives uh, to create more opportunities for those who wouldn't normally get an opportunity to work in this industry. And we're working on increased training, not just for our members, uh, but also making it available to colleges, community colleges, programs, and workforce development. Uh, as you've heard, one creation can create hundreds of jobs, multiple pre create, uh, productions create more jobs. Uh, additionally, this industry is largely recession proof. It's an industry that creates a project that fulfills a universal need entertainment. Uh, you should also know that uh, we were amongst the first industries back during the pandemic. We were back at work within four months of the pandemic, and we were using uh, a lot of small businesses doing purchases and things that no wouldn't have happened otherwise without this industry. So uh, with that, uh, I see I have 10 seconds just to say 40 states and territories uh, have programs in place and it averages $62.5 million as uh, the national average. Thank you. Starting down here. Uh, Mr. Chair, committee, uh, my name is John Krumpetich. I'm the owner of Historic Fort Ritchie, deep in center of Quarterman's territory. Um, we're undergoing a massive revitalization of an unused military base. Um, I sit at this table kind of on the other side as a landowner whose property was used for this, and we have a lot going on. So the thought of having um, a large-scale movie being filmed or show as this case Lioness, <clears throat> we, were met, we met it with some intrepidation. Uh, but very quickly, we found out how beneficial this was for our local community. Um, everyone in the area, every contractor, every store, every anybody who prov provided almost any service at all was flooded when Lioness show, showed up. 
It was remarkable. The team was professional. They were easy for us to work with. Uh, we were able to continue our 11 build outs in the midst of having as many people. I mean, at one point, I think there was 700 people on the property between crew and extras. The thing is, every one of those crew needs something. Every one of those extras needs something. So every day, every business in the area had work to do. You had contractors who were getting paid. You had gas that was being bought. A teeny store by us named GTs was bought out of propane in 10 minutes. You know, Lioness, the Paramount went up and said, we need all of your propane tanks right now. And they, they said, they laughed and they said, no, we actually need all of your propane tanks. <laughs> So for us, who's in the western part of the state and didn't have a ton of experience with the, the impact that a film like this can provide, I can tell you it's monstrous. It is something from for me as a businessman can really start to put numbers on and say we would absolutely have something like this back on our property. Because it just it, it's a quick impact, but a lasting impact for these places that are going to say, hopefully this returns, hopefully like something like this comes back. And I know that the, you know, you think about tax base and what returns to the state. Well, there's certainly a return when they rent 446 hotel rooms. So I, I for one, support this bill fully, and I just hope we have more films in the state of Maryland. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Nikki Powell. And I'm actually the recent uh, locations coordinator on the Lioness. And I thank you for your time today. Um, I am in full support of Senate Bill 452 that calls for the increase of the film production activity credit to 50 million by 2025 and each fiscal year thereafter. I agree with Maryland Film Industry Coalition and the Baltimore Film Office that it is imperative to increase this tax credit to attract more television produ productions to Maryland. I also stand in solidarity with my union brothers and sisters of IATSE Local 487 and just to share with you how this tax credit directly impacts our lives and careers. Uh, I'm a local. I am from Baltimore. I'm a product of Baltimore City Schools. After graduating Baltimore Polytechnic Institute, Completing an undergraduate degree at the University of Maryland in College Park, I obtained my master's degree in film and media from Johns Hopkins in 2019. And it was a tremendous blessing to be able to work on four major productions that include The Spook Who Sat by the Door, which is a pilot for FX, Netflix's Black and Missing docuseries, HBO's We Own This City, and recently Paramount's Lioness after graduation. In my role as a locations coordinator, I've been able to hire students from Morgan State University, MICA, Johns Hopkins, and Towson. I've also been able to hire companies and pay homeowners that support the efforts of film production in Maryland. I even have a uh, assistant here today, Bird Mitchell, who runs a nonprofit that trains the next upcoming filmmakers. Um, finally, I would just like to say that if we don't have a viable pipeline for film and television production, people will have to move. Four of my last assistants moved to Atlanta. It is my sincerest desire to work and live in Maryland. So please support this bill. Okay. You. okay. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I'll please. go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry. I just ran down the street. <laughs> they allowed me time to catch my breath. Um, my name is Keith Mellinger. I'm the director of the screenwriting and animation program at Morgan State University. And everything that has been said before me um, is just vectors into everything that I have to say about pathways to careers. Um, I speak on behalf of higher education. There are many film programs in this state and uh, we're one of them. We're probably the newest one at Morgan State University with the screenwriting and animation program. We have a stake in this, as do all of the film programs, because we're talking about probably thousands of students who are in these majors. And we would like some of them, all of them, 
many of them to stay in the state because we have some gems in our programs. These are future filmmakers, future storytellers, but they're also future innovators. What gets lost about the film industry is what it spawns outside of film. So um, I'm all in on the uh, Senate bill, but we have a, a additional stake in this. We own what was the largest soundstage in Baltimore City. And we are looking to also become part of the uplift that comes from the Senate bill, this house bill, to bring more film and television business into Baltimore. We're also looking to turn that soundstage into a training platform, working with the unions to train people from the city who don't necessarily have degrees in cinematic arts, applied cinematic arts and sciences. Film is collaborative. We cannot learn the craft without exposure. We need more films and television productions coming to Baltimore, coming to Maryland to increase exposure. Thank you. Hi, my name is Justin Ross. I'm the Senior Vice President at Next Level Sports Entertainment, a sports network uh, that in the last uh, 18 months has moved to Maryland. We're in 35 million U.S. households. And uh, so I wasn't always in the sports and in, uh, in television industry. And, uh, and so what I've seen sort of somebody who's coming in into to, you know, a brand new industry is that this is an opportunity that the, the gentleman talked about is that you're creating a, a real sort of ecosystem and that the skills that people learn sort of whether they're, you know, pulling cable day one, you know, they, there's, there is a path, there's an apprenticeship, there's an opportunity uh, to, to grow and to build in a way that I frankly don't know that there's a ton of other um, industries that are still left like that. It doesn't matter where you came from, it doesn't matter what you did, if you're willing to work hard and learn, like there is a path all the way up. Um, you know, the, but the other thing that's sort of exciting about it is when we find ourselves in this moment where there's a true decentralization of, of content being made, right? It used to be like four, uh, uh, th you know, four groups out in California. Now everybody, like, you know, I, I, you turn on the weather channel, they're going to have like a, a movie, right? Like it's just everybody's making content. Um, there, so there's an opportunity uh, for a lot of ownership sort of that, that, that's created in that ownership of, from the directors, the writers, the producers, um, that I think is, you know, sort of also this unique moment. So I think, you know, we have an opportunity with this tax credit bill, um, if, you know, to, if you guys pass this, you know, to increase our ability to, uh, to produce films, but also really to produce filmmakers. And that's a really exciting opportunity. And, um, you know, Senator Benson, you know, I, I, I will preach like the converted that um, this is this is something that is just absolutely um, you know, sort of for every reason, I think, is, is sort of right on time. Senator Stalling. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I should have said this earlier to the other panel, but I'll say it to you and to the good chairman of finance and, and the sponsor of this bill. And I'm a co-sponsor. I believe in this. Um, as, as our chairman knows, I've had people come to me and, and told me more than once, we want to make a movie in your community. Um, and they're very sincere and they have backing. Uh, they have done movies in Florida and they said they wanted to do in Baltimore, but they didn't have the financing. And I know working with this good Senator here and working with you, I, and I know that the chair believes in this too. I'm not going to speak up for him, but I believe because I've talked to him. This is this is something that I know that we need to do because I've seen it firsthand when I was in Florida and what happened there. He showed me the site and I was amazed what was going on and all the action as you are a part of. So I love to see that here in Maryland. I love to see that in Baltimore. But I want to thank you all for coming and, and being a part of this. I think it's exciting and I look forward to it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Okay, uh, I don't see any other questions. So um, I don't know if there anyone else. Is there anyone else here who wanted to speak on this issue? No? All right, well, thank you all thank very you. much. Appreciate it. Chairwoman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, guys. See you next door. Right. So um, I failed to um, announce when uh, we could clear out and we need to keep moving on.
um, if we could, uh, um, I failed to announce at the beginning, we're going to keep basically the order that's that's been out um, out front. There's going to be one modification. Uh, Senate Bill 556 will be after the next bill. Um, and the next two bills are mine. And uh, as this, the committee knows, I've invited my staff to help present bills. Um, my my uh, folks in my office who are learning about the whole process. So on uh, 363, um, if those uh, who are going to be on the panel want to come forward. Okay. And Lola, you can kick it off. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. My name is Lola Oduye, and I work in Senator Gazzoni's office, and I'm here to present Senate Bill 363, Video Lottery Terminal Proceeds, Purse Dedication Account, Ocean Downs Racecourse Operating Loss Assistance. By statute, for the last 12 years, Ocean Downs Racetrack has been reimbursed for racing operational losses up to $1.2 million. This money comes out of the standard bread purse dedication account and has no effect on state money as seen in the fiscal note. This bill converts the $1.2 million to a daily number of 30,000 so that Ocean Downs can raise additional days without returning to the legislature for approval. We have a panel that includes representatives from both Ocean Downs Racetrack and the Cloverleaf Standard Bread Owners Association. Thank you and I ask for a favorable report of Senate Bill 363. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the oh, yeah. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, she did just a great job of introducing that, so I don't have a lot to say. Uh, my name is Bill Rickman. My other businesses are located in Rockville, Maryland, Rickman Construction Company, Rickman Management. I'm involved in many companies that do uh, involved in biotech and pharma. In 2001, I purchased Ocean Downs Racetrack, not far from Ocean City. Uh, it's backed on Turville Creek and the lake that is behind uh, Ocean City. So it's a beautiful piece of property surrounded by pot, prop, water. I know many of you were there during Mako and could see it for yourselves. In 2017, I sold Ocean Downs to Churchill Downs. I have uh, continued to help them to develop uh, Ocean Downs as a destination location for standard bread racing. Uh, today, I'm here to support Senate Bill 363. She mentioned uh, for the past 12 years, we've had reimbursements uh, from the purses. And this is just, uh, and we expend that for 40 to 48 days of racing and then apply to the Maryland Racing Commission to cover operational losses. This uh, bill, again, turns it into a daily amount. Uh, last year, uh, Rosecroft Raceway was uh, under contract to be sold and developed. The sale fell through, but the le this legislation will protect and enable the horsemen to get additional race days at Ocean Downs, which would be badly needed. I hope you can support this bill. Standard bread racing is very important to the industry in Maryland. And I uh, next up will be Bobby Samples and we'll wait for questions. Okay. Thank you, Chairman and members of the committee. Good afternoon. My name is Bobby Sample and I'm the general manager at Ocean Downs Racetrack. I'm here today to testify in support of Senate Bill 363. Ocean Downs is a standard bread racetrack in Worcester County, Maryland. We typically run 40 to 48 live race days each year between Memorial Day and Labor Day, when we have the benefit of 300,000 tourists just six miles away in Ocean City. For more information, I've included a quick fact sheet and some pictures in your folders. As Bill Rickman mentioned, the agreement last summer to sell Rosecroft fell through. However, the likely prospect of a future contract to purchase the land suggests that the racetrack could close again as it did in 2010. The Maryland Standard Bread Horsemen race all year long between both tracks. In anticipation of Rosecroft clo Rosecroft's closure last summer, I had lengthy discussions with the horsemen as to whether Ocean Downs could extend our meet and add race days. If we were to do so, we would incur more payroll costs for the staff, additional simulcast costs for wagering, as well as all the other expenses to put on a live race meet. Given that the additional days would be outside the summer tourist season, we anticipate there would be lower attendance and consequently lower wagering on track. This would lead to larger losses that would not be covered under the current statute. 
For the last 12 years, Ocean Downs has applied for and received the maximum loss reimbursement of $1.2 million from the Standard Bread Purse Dedication Account. Senate Bill 363 allows the minimum 40-day meet and the $1.2 million cap to be calculated at $30,000 per live race day, so that in the event we need to add live race days for the horsemen, we can do so without any delay. The Standard Bread Horsemen support this legislation, and you have a letter from their president in your folder, and he's also here today to testify as to the importance of this measure. In closing, this change would give Ocean Downs the flexibility to increase the number of live race days in the event that we are the only Standard Bread track in Maryland and enable the Maryland horsemen to race more in our state. I appreciate your consideration of this bill and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Chairman, members of the committee, good afternoon. My name is Jonathan Roberts. I'm president of the Cloverleaf Standard Bread Owners Association. Our organization represents all the horsemen, owners, trainers, and drivers that in our state of Maryland. I'm here today in support of Bill 363. Earlier this year, we were informed that Rosecroft could be sold. The closure of this track would have been devastating to the standard bread industry in Maryland. We currently race year-round in Maryland with race days divided up between Ocean Downs and Rosecroft. Losing one of our tracks would have left the standard bread horsemen with just half of our racing opportunities in Maryland. This would force the standard bred horsemen to seek racing opportunity outside the state of Maryland, depriving our state of all the economic benefits of running a standard bred racehorse operation, affecting a wide net of retailers and service providers from feed shops, farmers, vet service providers, stable employees, blacksmiths, the list goes on, not to mention the open space that the standard bred industry offers. Senate Bill 363 represents an opportunity to provide a measure of security to the standard bred horsemen racing in Maryland, allowing Ocean Downs the flexibility to increase days immediately in the event that Rosecroft closes. Since this process takes time and can only occur during session, passing Bill 363 now prevents the possibility of only racing a half of a year in the future, which would be catastrophic for many of the horsemen, potentially causing households in your district the inability to economically survive. Please consider passing Senate Bill 363 and helping us preserve standard bread racing and all the positive economic benefits and potential tourism opportunities that it provides to the state. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Questions with panel? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Next, <clears throat> next up. Senate Bill 556, Maryland Community uh, Health Resources Commission. The panel can come up. Betsy's going to take the lead here, and we're uh, grateful uh, to see our our colleague, our former colleague here. Yes. So that's a great day. I mean, doing films. I know. It made you, me feel I mean, very good. You, no, the film's still did, there. Did, did, did you uh, really, uh, that was a highlight of what, what you accomplished. Here. I know. That's great. Thank that's you great. very much. You bet. Betsy. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, and members of the committee. My name is Betsy Hickson, and I'm a legislative intern in Senator Gazzoni's office, and I am here to present Senate Bill 556, Maryland Community Health Resources Commission Compensation of Employees. Senate Bill 556 would provide the Maryland Community Health Resources Commission with the authority to determine the salaries of its employees with consultation and approval from the Maryland Department of Budget and Management. This would provide the same level of salary setting authority that currently exists at Maryland's two other health regulatory commissions, the Health Services Cost Review Commission and the Maryland Health Care Commission. The governor's budget for fiscal year 2024 provides a total of six new full-time positions for the commission. Senate Bill 556 would provide the commission with increased authority to set the salaries for these new positions and would assist the commission in recruiting a qualified and diverse pool of applicants. Thank you, and I ask for a favorable report of Senate Bill 556. Thank you, Betsy. Pretty much says, says what the, the bill is and does. Uh, it's good to be back. It's nice to see uh, many of you. Makes me feel good to come back and see you're, you're good, we're in good hands. Um, we want to thank Chairman Gazoon for uh, sponsoring this bill. Uh, 
as maybe you know, uh, our workload has expanded significantly. Uh, for many years now, we've provided grants for medically underserved communities, uh, usually in the area of $8 million. But in recent years, with the passage of two pieces of legislation, the Health Equity Resource Bill and the Kerwin Bill, which uh, included in, in the end of the bill, the uh, consortium on community supports, which is to deal with behavioral health of all of our public school students, uh, our workload has increased significantly for the small staff we have. And I, I aired and before I started on that our executive director, Mark Luckner is here, who has done a fabulous job for over 15 years with the commission, just, just incredible work. Anyway, um, the governor this year did give us extra funding and did provide for six uh, full-time pins to help us. However, uh, uh, we've had uh, or tried to get recruit employees for over a year now. We've been unable to get a, a good quality person uh, for the, uh, the pathway grants that we provided. We've tried to hire a coordinator and a, a very good salary, I thought, but, but not, unable to do it. So we believe that um, if we had this authority with the uh, consultation of DBM, that we could recruit uh, uh, the kind of diversity and talent that we're looking for. So we ask for a favorable uh, report on this bill, please. And Mark and I'd be glad to ask, answer any questions if you have them. Question, <clears throat> Senator Jackson. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great to see you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, welcome home. Uh, quick question for you. Uh, here's a piece of legislation that um, uh, I'm the House sponsor of that would uh, create an advisory committee uh, regarding health care, uh, uh, mental health um, access for our for MHEC, uh, our institutions of higher learning. Uh, would that impact your staff as well? And if so, could you elaborate? I think, I think the... Uh direction of the consortium is just the public school. Just the public school. Okay, yes. thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you. Great to see you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So begins the Porterman Show. Mm hmm. Oh, please. That's all right. Uh, Chair Gazzoni, Vice Chair Rose Pet, members of uh, the committee. The record center, Paul Quarterman, District 2, representing Washington and Frederick Counties. Uh, thank you for the opportunity today to present Senate Bill 518. Uh, right after that, we're also going to hear, uh, you know, Senate Bill, uh, excuse me, we're first going to do 563 and then 518. Uh, both of them are a continued collaboration uh, by our former colleague and good friend, Senator Edwards. Uh, he introduced a number of these concepts last year. Uh, and with the continued collaboration between uh, the city of Frostburg, the city of Cumberland, as well as the city of Hagerstown uh, brings us here today. Um, I think it's important to note uh, that we have representatives from all three municipalities here today uh, in person, uh, just to signify how important this issue is to our communities in the western part of the state. Um, you know, this legislation is targeted at properties that are in severe disrepair. Uh, they're dangerous and pose potential health risks due to unlivable conditions. Uh, we want to make it known that this legislation will not penalize property owners that maintain their parcels. Rather, this bill would help keep accountable the owners that have either abandoned their properties or clearly have no interest uh, in keeping them in a, a livable condition. Um, so this bill would allow liens to be placed on properties that have unpaid abatement invoices uh, per municipalities, local nu nuisance codes. Uh, typically, these, these uh, notices are followed by once, twice, three, sometimes many times of um, notices, warnings to the property owner about blight and disrepair. Well, quite frankly, often those those calls go unanswered uh, because, quite frankly, the, the property has been abandoned or nobody cares. Um, current municipalities can file a case in district court where the property owner can come in and defend themselves. 
However, uh, again, the penalty is just another fine. Uh, again, the judgment doesn't actually force you to really do anything to fix up your property, just continues this cycle. Uh, so this bill would allow those liens to be treated in the same manner. Uh, the tax sale process would enable municipalities opportunity to really take action and help uh, remediate some of the issues of blight uh, that we see uh, you know, across not just these communities in Western Maryland, but a lot of communities around the state. So um, I'm going to pass off to some of my friends here, uh, but we do uh, would appreciate uh, your consideration and respectfully ask for a favorable report uh, on this bill. Uh, good after uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairman Gazone and the uh, rest of the members of the uh, of the committee. My name is Ray Morris. I am the the mayor of Cumberland. You know, and I know these bills are, you know, you look at them listed and they talk about uh, tax sales and revisions and things like that. But to me, what these bills are about is is about blight and removing blight from our community, and in some cases, being able to uh, to help a home before it becomes blighted. You know, each each home in, in a neighborhood affects the overall value of, of the homes in that in that neighborhood on that street. And once one or two homes become blighted, that becomes a neighborhood in which, quite frankly, people don't want to don't want to live in. And we're trying to be able to gain access to these properties to be able to restore them and make them livable because we're you know, we're we're talking about uh, blighted properties that are unoccupied and quite frankly, abandoned. And those are the ones that we're, we're speaking of here today. So, yeah, you know, and, and if we can restore these homes, uh, uh, that's that's the key to this whole this whole initiative is to be able to uh, to gain access and be able to restore these homes and make our communities better for uh, for everyone. Uh, with that, I would I would ask you for a favorable report on uh, on 563. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, everyone here this afternoon. My name is Mayor Bob Flanagan from the city of Frostburg. Um, just tagging on to what uh, Mayor Ray just said. In Frostburg, we obviously don't have the population that uh, the other two communities have uh, that are represented here today. However, we do have a, a community that has, takes a lot of pride. And uh, I have a very active staff um, that I've helped to develop over the last number of years. I've been at the home now for seven two-year terms. And a big thing for me is a clean community you know, a blight-free community, and we just don't, are not accepting of folks. I own my property owner myself, and I own quite a bunch of it, and we keep our grass cut, you know, and we, we keep our properties looking good, and we certainly don't, you know, embrace the broken window uh, that, uh, you know, law enforcement in this day has been fighting for many, many years, and so anything that I feel we can do to help government, you know, either steer people in the right direction or in this case, take possession of the property to get it back on the tax rolls, get it cleaned up. Uh, it's a good thing for maybe the whole state would want to adopt this, but right now it's something that we're looking for in Western Maryland. So we're hoping for that you all would support it and give us a favorable report. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Scott Nicewarner, city administrator for the city of Hagerstown. And I thank you uh, for the opportunity to sit here and ask for your favorable report on Senate Bill 563. This bill is one of two bills that in the second one you'll hear about shortly uh, that will provide municipalities with the flexibility we need to allow us to take control back over our most blighted and neighbor and most blighted and neighborhood threatening properties. Hagerstown, as you've heard, uh, it's similar to the other municipalities, suffers significant areas of blight that impede or destroy neighborhoods' ability to feel safe, live in quality housing with quality amenities, and provide a healthy home environment. The community looks to local government to partner with them in the effort to clean up these neighborhoods to allow them to afford just what seem to be the simple rights that they should be able to enjoy. Uh, this, neighborhood, this legislation is another tool in the toolbox to help us help them take their neighborhoods back from blighted conditions. This legislation allows those parcels that remain tax current that continue to accrue monthly abatement charges uh, for high grass and weeds, trash, unsecured doors and windows, mainly that have been broken uh, or completely removed, and other health issues that affect those that not only reside on the block, but may reside in, a, but definitely those that reside in the parcel immediately adjacent to the properties. Um, the, city, the last thing the city of Hagerstown wants to do is get in the real estate business, either as a landlord or a property owner. However, our situation is such that without the ability to remediate the seemingly increasing conditions of blight 
especially within our urban core, which is already struggling with societal issues, uh, we cannot expect to begin making those inroads and taking our municipalities back to provide quality, affordable, and safe housing for those that need it without the ability uh, that this legislation provides. So I, I ask uh, that uh, this uh, favorable support uh, comes out of this committee, and I thank you for your time. Thank you. Continue. Hi, my name is Michael Cohen. I am the city solicitor for the city of Cumberland and the city attorney for the city of Frostburg. So I'm here today wearing two hats. Um, I would like to say that I support what the other uh, witnesses have, have said. Uh, and I'd also like to inform you that before we came here, we ran some early interference and met with uh, representatives of large scale tax certificate purchasers. And yes, they had some concerns. And fortunately, we were able to work out all those concerns. So I don't think that you'll be hearing from them today, but if you did, you'd be hearing that they have no objections. Thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you. All done on the well panel. Yeah, Questions for, for the sponsor, members of the panel? Going once, going twice. Okay, thank you very much. Excellent, we'll move into the next one. Is that okay with you? Absolutely. Sure. All right, so this will be, um, Excuse me. Uh, this will be Senate Bill 518. Uh, again, thank you, committee, uh, for your participation. You have more witnesses? Oh, actually, we got more witnesses. I'm sorry. We have more witnesses, evidently. Sorry about that. Oh, yes. And therefore, it too. Thank you. It's a mass movement out there. Whoever would like to begin. Good afternoon, Vice Chair. My name is Jonathan Glazer, and I'm the Legislative Director with the Department of Assessments and Taxation. The Department is support with amendments for this bill, and we would just like to thank the bill sponsor and his staff for working with the Department, um, and uh, we, we appreciate that he will uh, view our amendments as favorable. Um, the Department supports the desire of the counties to expedite the process of returning nuisance uh, properties to productive use. However, notice is an important part of any governmental action, and a notice to a property owner of an action is a serious foreclosure, as serious as a foreclosure should not be waived when it may only add 60 days to the process. Current law would already allow the counties to initiate the bills foreclosed 60 days after the tax sale if they are sent a first notice immediately after the tax sale and a second notice 30 days later. When a property is vacant, current law would already permit counties to foreclose without prior notice after the tax sale. Waiving the foreclosure notice requirement for properties that are not designated vacant would give a homeowner very little opportunity to prepare and defend against foreclosure or to assemble the funds or access assistance resources to pay off or to pay off any county debt to avoid it. Thus, the department suggests amending Senate Bill 563, striking the final provision that permits the county to foreclose without prior notice. Um, so uh, again, I appreciate the sponsor working with us. And I also have the um, tax sale ombudsman, Robert Yeager here, if you have any additional questions. Any questions for the witnesses? Thank you very much. I believe we have several other witnesses who signed up. Uh, Ari Plant and uh, Frank Boston and Bob Yeager. Oh, Bob Yeager we had. Mr. Boston uh, will not will okay. not be here. So okay, I'll just proceed. Just me, but I'll be brief. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee. My name is Ari Plout, and I'm here on behalf of the Kenny Law Group and the Maryland Tax Health Participants Coalition. As Mr. Cohen stated, we worked collaboratively together in the in, over the summertime to hash out these two bills, Senate Bill 18, 518 and Senate Bill 563. And uh, we have we support the bills and we just appreciate the, the collaboration that we did with everybody. So thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much. OK, Senator Cordman, you're back. With your panel. All right, Mr. Chair, so this will be uh, Senate Bill 518. Uh, again, thank you, uh, committee, for the record, Senator Paul Quarterman, District 2, representing Washington and Frederick Counties. Again, thank you for the opportunity to present Senate Bill 518. Uh, as we said earlier, this bill and Senate Bill 563, you just heard, 
or a combined collaborational effort uh, between three municipalities you see here today, as well as a continuation of the work uh, that Senator Edwards did before me. Um, <clears throat> you know, it may come as a surprise of some of you uh, that our communities in Western Maryland are often viewed as more of our rural communities. Uh, the reality is our municipalities uh, are much like uh, the same as the municipalities around the state. We face the same challenges uh, that all the other municipalities do throughout the state, big or small. Um, and while our cities may not be as large, our cities are nonetheless the same with urban centers and with the same challenges those, those uh, come with it. Uh, you know, these three municipalities are the largest three municipalities west of Frederick, uh, Hagerstown, Cumberland, and, and the city of Frostburg. Uh, the challenges here today, uh, much like the other bill, are in regards to blighted properties and really focused on, in on what, you, what you've commonly heard before is the zombie properties. Uh, these properties continue to show up on tax sales year after year. They're falling apart. They're falling down. Uh, simply, this bill would allow municipalities and the designated counties to take swifter action in acquiring the properties that were offered at tax sale, but it remained in limbo and severe disrepair. Uh, unfortunately, many of these properties uh, often breed crime uh, and they possess a danger to those within the community. Uh, additionally, this bill would enable municipalities and the designated areas to intervene on properties that have been identified for demolition due to unsafe conditions, ultimately allowing more flexibility on the municipal level to assist in tackling the issues of blight. Uh, and again, as, as was previously stated, it should be noted, um, and you'll hear from the other members as well, it's not about occupied properties, but specifically targeting blighted zombie properties uh, within our communities to try to make our communities safer and more prosperous. So thank you again for your consideration and respectfully ask for your support on Senate Bill 518. Thank you. All right. Again, I'm Ray Morris. I'm the mayor of Cumberland, uh, and thank you for this opportunity. I, I think I really uh, said everything that uh, that I needed to say about the uh, the previous bill. I mean, the two uh, the two go hand in hand, working together to help us uh, prevent blight in our communities and and make our make our neighborhoods safer and better for for everyone to live. We, you know, as as the senator mentioned, uh, we are smaller uh, than than some of what some people may consider an urban area, but we have almost twenty thousand people in the city of Cumberland, but we have five hundred and twelve um, blighted properties. I think last year when I was here, I, I mentioned that in the city of Baltimore they. Uh, they have around thirteen thousand. Uh, so obviously, uh, we have much less, but on this on a scale, it's 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 equal to that that type of blight. And we truly would hope that you would uh, give us a favorable report on this bill five eighteen. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be, be brief too. Again, Mayor Bob Flanagan, City of Frostburg. You know, Frostburg is the home of Frostburg State University. Um, as an alum, and I know there's probably some folks in this room, I know one lady in particular across from me, uh, their daughter went to Frostburg State. We take a lot of pride, again, in our little college community. The, the university itself, which makes Frostburg kind of unique, the university itself is actually located within the city of Frostburg, three blocks from our downtown. So our student population, our parents, when they would come to visit their, their, uh, their, their students, whatnot, there's a, it's a, we can't hide. I mean, it's right out in front of everybody. And I think the last thing any university community needs in the state of Maryland or any state, again, is any blight or, uh, you know, grass not being cut, you know, the, the buildings not being maintained, et cetera. So we, we need to put a good face on every day. And these two bills will help us do that. So, again, hope that you all can uh, support these. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, members of the committee. Again, my name is Michael Cohen. I'm the attorney for cities of Frostburg and also for Cumberland. Uh, with this bill, I wanted to address just what context it, 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 where our concerns appear in. Uh, when real estate taxes aren't sold or unpaid, properties get sold at tax sale. The tax sale is held by auction. The successful bidder is the one who uh, acquires the tax certificate. Holding the tax certificate enables the successful bidder to then file a foreclosure in order to obtain title to the subject property. Now, uh, the issue here is blighted properties. And with blighted properties, when the tax sale certificate holders file foreclosures, um, it, they have more of an impetus to abandon the tax sale proceedings. And they might abandon the, the tax sales midstream and they might abandon them at the very end. So these bills address both of those circumstances, a midstream abandonment and an end of the case abandonment. Uh, now, at the end of the, well, first off, while, while, while the cases are pending, if a tax sale foreclosure uh, purchaser um, abandons it. That case will just sit there in limbo and the pro nothing will be done with the property and it, it will just languish and continue to uh, fall apart. Um, with the other measure, at the end of the foreclosure, uh, 
property, I'm sorry, the, the, the foreclosing tax sale purchaser has the ability to acquire title. At that point in time, they then present a deed to the uh, tax collector who was obligated to transfer the property, sign the deed uh, upon the payment of the back taxes. Um, and some of these guys who purchased the tax certificates and gals, uh, they, uh, they don't submit, they don't do what they have to do at the end of the case. They don't uh, submit a, a deed to the tax collector and they don't pay the taxes because they don't want the properties, they're blighted. So what this enables the local governments to do is to step in and to have the, upon motion filed, to have the court transfer the tax certificates to them and then they can foreclose and do what, you know, as though they were the original purchasers. Thank you. Just briefly, um, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chairman, members of the committee against Scott Nice Warner, uh, City of Hagerstown, City Administrator. Um, ditto to everything that's been said on this bill. Uh, I can tell you that this is a process that internally Washington County and City of Hagerstown have worked on for over a decade. Um, and the, the ability uh, to have more flexibility in trying to get some of this uh, repeated tax sales set, they're called zombies, we call them chronics, uh, that are always going back to tax sale, in many cases, are habitable uh, with a little bit of work done that we could get potentially into the hands of nonprofits uh, that could turn them around and make that uh, good, uh, affordable housing is a game changer for our community. And uh, and and we sincerely hope that that uh, this legislation comes out of this committee with a favorable favorable report and we can get to work on on getting our neighborhoods back. Uh, to the quality of life they they deserve. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions, members of the panel? Going once, going twice. No. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Sure. And Thank then you. the next group of witnesses. Everyone who wants to testify this bill, come on up. <laughs> all right. A lot of enthusiasm for this bill. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair and Vice Chair. Again, Jonathan Glazer, Legislative Director with the State Department of Assessments and Taxation. We do appreciate, once again, the Senator and his staff working with our department on an amendment. Uh, the department is supporting with the amendment. So the department suggests that an amendment to Senate Bill 518 be given to give a property owner the opportunity to exercise their right to file a motion to strike and pay off their lien before the county's new right to the same filing created in this bill kicks in. Currently, when the lien purchaser fails to take title 90 days after the foreclosure, the homeowner gains the right to move to strike the foreclosed judgment. This clears the way for the homeowner to pay off the balance and clear the title. Senate Bill 518 would give the local jurisdictions the same right for the same 90 days. While this bill does prevent the county from moving to strike in the favor if the homeowner has already entered a motion first, it'll be a race to the courthouse after 90 days and the homeowner won't likely move as quickly as the county. To give property owners the first chance to maintain ownership, Estat suggests amending the bill on page three, line 25, from 90 days to a larger amount of days so that the homeowner has the first opportunity to submit a motion to strike before the county gains that right. I also have uh, Robert Yeager, the tax sale ombudsman for the State Department of Assessments and Taxation, if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, esteemed members of the committee. Once again, I'm Ari Plout. I'm here on behalf of the Kenny Law Group and the Tax Sale Participant Coalition. I believe we signed up in support with amendments, but we actually were able to work this out in the interim and we support these the, the bill, both Senate Bills 563 and 518. Um, we, like I stated in my previous testimony, we appreciate the work we did with the previous panel and we just ask for a favorable report. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions for members of the panel? Thank you all very, very much. Uh, Quarterman. Yes, sir. Did it. 432, correct? Yes. All right, Mr. Chairman, Vice Chair, members of the committee, 
Uh, for the record, Senator Paul Quarterman, District 2, representing Washington and Frederick Counties. Uh, thank you for the opportunity today to present Senate Bill 432, the Inheritance Tax Repeal, also known as the Death Tax. Uh, some of you may have heard this bill before, as it's been uh, introduced a variety of times uh, over the last several years. Uh, currently, Maryland is only one of six states in the country that impose an inheritance tax. The current rate is 10%. And we are the only state in the country that has both an estate tax and an inheritance tax. And while there are a lot of exemptions for grandparents, spouses, children, stepchildren, et cetera, uh, Marylanders who have lived, worked, and raised their families and have contributed to our communities should not be forced to have their assets or their earnings subject to such an aggressive tax post-mortem, uh, particularly when they have spent years paying taxes of various kinds during their lifetime, most likely within our state. Uh, their wealth belongs to them or the individuals for which it has been left in their will, and it should be their decision on when and how and where it goes after they pass. Uh, we are aware that the statewide register of wills have shared concerns over this legislation as they have in the past, and we welcome an ongoing conversation regarding possible solutions to their concerns. Uh, obviously, their concern uh, is mostly to deal with how this tax funds a lot of their operations. However, I think we can all agree if this tax was repealed or at a minimum reduced, that the constitutional obligation that we have to their uh, office would not be dismissed and their offices would not collapse. Uh, and to that, I would look to the wisdom of this committee on how we could balance the a possible repeal or reduction uh, along at the same time providing the funding obligations that we have to the Registered Wills. Uh, so again, thank you for consideration and I respectfully ask for a favorable report. Thank you. Questions for the Senator? I think we have uh, two uh, folks unfavorable online. Um, Alexis Burrell Road. Yes, thank you, Alexis Burrell Rody. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity. And I am here today. I'm the Register of can, Wills. Can you hold on for one second? Oh. One second. We're having a little uh, audio issue. <clears throat> can, you, can you speak again? Hi, good morning. Can you hear me? That's a little better. Yep, thank you. Okay. Great. So I am Alexis burrell Rody. I'm the Register of Wills for Baltimore County, and I'm here um, before this committee to urge an unfavorable report on Senate Bill 432. This bill would be an economic disaster for both the Register of Wills and the state of Maryland. In fiscal year 2022, my office took in $23 million in inheritance taxes on behalf of this, the state of Maryland and 1.55 million in other probate fees. We used about 4.2 million to run our office, almost entirely to devoted, to, that amount is almost entirely devoted to paying salaries and benefits for our my 43 employees. Uh, the remaining 20, 0.3 million was sent back to the state of Maryland for discretionary use in the state's general fund. If the inheritance tax is abolished, the state would lose $20 million just from Baltimore County alone and just under $90 million uh, statewide from all of the registered offices. My office would run a deficit of about $3 million. And in order to continue serving the people of Baltimore County in a meaningful capacity, the state would then need to fund my office for about $3 million per year. And at this time, this, there's been no proposal for any viable alternative funding for, source for my office. And it just seems premature to introduce legislation removing this funding source without any viable alternatives. Um, under current law, the vast majority of individuals do not pay an inheritance tax. It's charged to non-lineal descendants only. Um, statewide, only about 10% of individuals pay an inheritance tax. And of these individuals, roughly half live out of state. So the total inheritance tax um, in Baltimore County, 80% of the total tax burden was paid by less than 2% of the estates pending in my office. This means repealing the, the tax is, a, is basically a gift to the very wealthiest individuals, many of whom don't even live in the state of Maryland. So eliminating this tax that's paid by very few Mar Marylanders would be a budgeting disaster and create a windfall for ultra wealthy individuals, many of whom are not even Maryland residents. For these reasons, I respectfully request that this committee uh, come back with an unfavorable report for Senate Bill uh, 432. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Byron McFarland. 
Uh, well, good afternoon, <clears throat> uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Um, I, I just want to, I guess, associate myself with the remarks of my counterpart in Baltimore County, and I'm not going to repeat a lot of what she said. I do just want to uh, uh, identify myself as a Register of Wells for Howard County uh, and uh, say that the Maryland Register of Wells Association unanimously opposes this bill. I um, also want to recognize a couple of my colleagues who I believe are there in the committee room with you, uh, Erica Griswold and Mary Raleigh, the registers for Anne Arundel and Frederick Counties. Um, who are newly elected registers, so we welcome them to our family. Um, I do just want to emphasize uh, what my colleague said, that this would not just defund a vital component of our judiciary, it would also deprive the general fund of a lot of money. Last year, uh, in fiscal 2022, the registers of wills turned over $89.2 million to the general fund for the legislature to spend on the welfare of our, our, our citizens. Um, and as my colleague said, too, most of these taxes are not paid by Marylanders. They're not paid by close relatives, spouses, siblings, children, grandchildren, parents, grandparents, stepchildren are already exempt from this tax. So this will defund our offices. It will cost uh, the general fund almost $100 million. It will go to people who don't live in Maryland predominantly. Some people don't even, don't even live in America. Um, and so with all of that, uh, it's hard to see how this is a justified um, measure, uh, and we would urge an unfavorable report. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, questions for these two witnesses? Thank you very much. That concludes the hearing on that bill, and we move on to 442. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, thank you. Round it out here. Uh, colleagues, Senate Bill 432, uh, Mr. Chair, Vice Chair, Members of the Committee, thank you today. Uh, for the record, again, Senator Paul Quarterman, District 2, representing Washington Frederick Counties, and thank you for the opportunity to present this bill to you today. Uh, this is essentially a cleanup uh, technical fix from last year. As everyone's aware, this committee and the General Assembly passed uh, House Bill 897 unanimously, uh, both, again, out of this committee and on the floor. That provided funding to our minor league facilities across the state, i.e. the facilities in Frederick, Bowie, Aberdeen, Delmarva. However, the Hagerstown facility was unintentionally inadvertently excluded from that list. Uh, again, this simply provides a technical change, which would allow that facility to participate in the same manner as the other like facilities across the state, as was the original intent of that legislation last year. Uh, additionally, it would increase the potential available funds to be increased from 200 million to 220 million to, to address inflationary pressures, uh, much the same as we've seen across the state in a variety of projects. Uh, it's important to note though, that this revenue source that is needed to support the debt service does not change uh, from the original bill from last year. So essentially there's no additional uh, physical impact uh, to the state. Uh, you'll find letters of support for the Maryland Stadium Authority in regards to this uh, cleanup basically from last year. And again, we thank you for your consideration and respectfully ask for a favorable report on Senate Bill 442. Questions for the Senator. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> moving on. Uh, Senator Zucker, 476, and you want to bring up, you got the number of people who want to testify in favor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chairman, distinguished members of the Budget and Taxation Committee. For the record, uh, Senator Craig Zucker uh, here on behalf of Senate Bill 476. Uh, really, I just want to focus in on the indemnity mortgage exemption. So uh, indemnity mortgages is something between basically a third party where a third party would come in and leverage their real property uh, as basically collateral security for another transaction between a borrower and lender. And back in, uh, and it's taxed now in Maryland, but uh, that wasn't always the case. It changed in 2012. Uh, it was uh, basically taxed at anything um, uh, at a million dollars above. And then in, uh, a year later, it was 3 million. And um, now what we're looking to do is increase that more. And why, why, is, that, why is that so? It's because the way I look at it is, um, amongst other things is we're having a severe uh, affordable housing shortage. And when we want to bring in uh, small businesses and, and investors to um, invest in, in communities that are very important to us, uh, sometimes they, they often uh, 
confront roadblocks, especially when it comes to taxes. So this legislation is to provide an avenue where uh, we do have a severe housing shortage. Um, right now, it's estimated that the state of Maryland is short uh, anywhere between uh, 80 to 120,000 units of affordable housing. So anything that we could think of creatively to help uh, spur activity, uh, creating affordable housing across the state, and also making sure that people are investing in the state, I believe is, is the way we want to go. Uh, and with that, I'll uh, turn it over to my panel. Thank you, Senator. Good morning, Chairman Gazone and members of the Senate Budget Committee. We appreciate the time that you've given us. My name is Howard Perlow, and I'm the Vice President of Residential Title and Escrow Company located in Owings Mills, Maryland. I thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony in support of Senate Bill 476. I've been in the real estate industry for over 45 years, specifically in the settlement title business. Prior to my entry in this industry 45 years ago, small businesses, small home builders, small real estate developers were always able to use indemnity mortgages or deeds of trust, the same thing, um, to borrow from savings and loans, investors, banks, and private investors. Um, there was no tax on these mortgages. And in 2011, Governor O'Malley needed some funding for teacher pensions and went to the legislature to raise $40 million. During, um, and ultimately, as the senator said, um, we were able to bring back um, a prior indemnity mortgages, which were previously approved, and allow them up to $3 million. Um, we are here today to ask the legislature to consider increasing the cap on the mortgages to $15 million. Of 50 states in the union, only seven charge a mortgage tax, and along the east coast of America, Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Delaware, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, West Virginia, and Ohio charge no mortgage tax. Our neighboring state of Virginia has a very low mortgage tax of one-tenth of one percent. When the last increase for the use of indemnities was passed in 2013, the amount of revenue that all the counties in Maryland received was approximately $237 million. In fiscal 2019 through 21, the revenue generated from all counties was between 520 million each year up to 637 million in 2021. Thank you, thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Brett Leininger uh, here today. Uh, with residential uh, title and escrow company, really to echo uh, the sentiments provided by uh, our sponsor. And thank you to Senator Zoker for sponsoring the legislation. We think that this should not be a stagnant number. It's been quite some time. As Mr. Perlow referenced, the, the revenues have changed dramatically. Uh, inflation has taken place. And I think this is a balanced approach to it. Uh, on the House uh, side, the opponents uh, characterized this as really a tax avoidance scheme, something to that effect. I think it's really just uh, an ec economic growth policy um, that the, the legislature has recognized as being important. And so we're just looking to tweak it to be based on uh, today's inflationary numbers and to address the affordable housing crisis. In, in the fiscal note, uh, Mr. Perlow referenced some of the uh, the uh, revenue numbers. It's projected that additionally in FY 2022, uh, the revenue uh, is looking to be about 609 million. So it just shows that there's a, a significant trend uh, going upward and it's not just a, a blip in the map uh, in a time when uh, the interest rates were rising significantly. So. Uh, with that, we appreciate the opportunity to testify and uh, urge a favorable report. Any questions for this panel? No, oh, so have. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. So you all have made reference to the development of affordable housing a few times. Can you, in real terms, walk me through how that happens and is enhanced through this bill? Absolutely, including a testimony here today from other groups from the western part of the state. Um, many organizations, nonprofits and all, um, when they borrow money from a bank, have to pay this mortgage tax as well. They are not exempt from it. There are ways to structure this, and we've done that to try to save. Um, I represented the uh, Patterson Park Development Corporation, and they did like 200 homes in a year. Um, they didn't have great um, 
um, depth of borrowing power from the banks and doing this to be able to save that hopefully went right back into the building and rehabbing of houses in Baltimore City at that point. Um, I've seen it with uh, Habitat for the Humanity, again, that they can go to banks uh, that are willing to lend, um, especially if they're able to show that they're profitable and can build houses and turn it at that point. In my 45 years in this business, affordable housing has been very important to me. And that's really why I came back and project, uh, presented to increase the number, because I've seen how many um, small builders, builders that are building housing that people can afford um, in the Baltimore area. We, You all know about Pimlico and everything being happening around the Pimlico racetrack and the amount of housing that's coming um, online in the next year now, it's finally starting, is affordable housing. And many of those developers um, you know, need that help to make these deals work, to be able to build these senior housing, affordable housing um, you know, at that point. And it is really very important for our state. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can I have one follow-up? Sure. Um, thank you, Mr. Perlow. Um, uh, question, because it was mentioned here that it's also used in the development of commercial property. Can Do you have a breakdown between kind of what is used for housing and what is used for commercial development? We don't. The information that we've obtained has come from legislative services, and I don't believe they've ever broken that down. Um, you know, there is a bill that allows commercial development to refinance their property and pay the tax and then pay the tax only on the new money if they were to refinance. Um, but there are many you know, projects that I see. There's a project in Chevy Chase that was just built three major apartment houses that was probably about $400 million for the three apartment buildings. Montgomery County received over $4.5 million in recordation tax. They also, because of the construction of these projects, receive about $6 million in new property taxes. Um, so anything that's a large project that most of our commercial things would be over the $15 million is going to be taxed at the full rate that any of the counties, the 24 counties in Maryland have. But I do believe that it is somewhat a competitive disadvantage for our state based on all these other states around us that don't have any tax on development. It's sort of almost a tax on borrowing from a bank. Um, even um, ourselves, if we were to borrow on HELOC loans, home, home equity loans, those banks have to pay a mortgage tax for the home buyers. Um, I don't know that that seems really fair to me personally. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. So uh, anyone else who's favorable, who is here on this, can come forward. Valentine, who, whoever wanted to. So Carrington, Anton, anybody who's on the favorable. Mr. Chair, with your permission, I'll start. My name Please. is Tom Valentine with NIOP Maryland. We're a commercial real estate trade association. Our members use indemnity mortgages to finance construction and ten tenant improvements in commercial buildings and, and sometimes for um, land development projects. Um, and applying the, the a tax to to debt is a first cost that creates a barrier and complicates project economics. Um, the exemption help, helps to reduce the stacking of transactional taxes that can sometimes happen during the development process. And in this market, there are, there are big players like pension funds and insurance companies that are in the real estate business that don't use debt financing. So this approach is, is one that allows smaller companies to access capital at slightly lower cost. Um, it is called a, a loophole by the opponents, but it's really a policy choice to way to incentivize and, and stimulate investments in, in capital, in buildings that eventually raise the commercial assessed base and turn money back into local governments. So for those reasons, we'd, um, we're here to support it and urge your favorable report. Thank you. Uh, Lori Graff, I'm the CEO of Maryland Building Industry Association. Um, we are a residential trade association on residential construction. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I'm going to touch on a couple of things that have already been uh, mentioned, but um, I just want to make sure that um, you understand the differences here. So this actually is something that's very supported for the smaller builders um, because of the, the caps. Um, so it's it's not just the big 
companies that you're thinking of. It's, these, it's some small builders that will take advantage of this. Um, also, we need housing. We know we need housing. There is a housing shortage in the state of Maryland. We talked about affordable housing, but there's also something called attainable housing, housing that people can afford. And this bill is just one of the many, many tools that we can use to try to move the state forward to have more housing. And once we have more housing, that makes rents more affordable. That makes just housing in general more affordable. Yes, it helps the affordable housing market as well, but it also helps the market rate, just making things a little bit more affordable. We need a lot of tools, um, and this is just one of the uh, steps forward um, in this market. So for that, we uh, request a favorable report. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for this panel? Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm. Yeah. Uh, if there are no more in the favorable, I have a couple in unfavorable. Uh, Kevin Canale, Michael Kovu, Kovu. Do we have someone online too? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, Kevin Canale here, respectfully, on, on behalf of the Maryland Association of Counties, respectfully in opposition to this bill. Um, I think the proponents did a, a good job explaining what the bill would do. Our opposition to the bill, yes, there's a fiscal impact, but this is also a, an issue of fairness. Um, recordation tax, Maryland has decided that's part of the revenue structure. You heard about other states who don't have this tax, but they have taxes that Maryland doesn't have. So there's a, there's a lot of balance that goes into this. Um, this bill would only apply for a mortgage that went through an IDOT process. So first of all, an IDOT is for the entire purpose of avoiding taxes. There's, there's no other way about it. So if somebody went out and got a $15 million loan and didn't use an IDOT, this bill would not apply to them. It would only apply for folks who went out and had an attorney or a CPA that could draft up this IDOT, uh, and then they would get the tax break. It's also important to remember that homeowners pay recordation tax on these transactions. So what we're asking for here, what they're asking for is to expand a loophole that currently exists. Um, we've also heard a lot of talk about affordable housing. There's no mention of affordable housing in this bill. This bill would apply to affordable housing projects potentially. It would also apply to the Burger King down the street that somebody wanted to build, right? So I think we'd be amenable if the bill was amended to say that this would only apply to affordable housing projects. We care very much about affordable housing. It's something that counties are very invested in. And, um, and so again, I think that that's a good point that they make and we want to see those projects advance as well and make them easy to build, but there's nothing in this bill that talks about affordable housing. So we really think this is a fairness issue. Again, homeowners pay this tax. We think that um, these loans should be taxed in the same way. And with that, we'd ask for an unfavorable report and we're happy to work on amendments or answer any questions. Thank you very much. Questions for Mr. Canale? Okay, online we have Diane Fox. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. Thank you for allowing me to testify. As a Director of Treasury for Frederick County, I urge the committee to give Senate Bill 476 an unfavorable report. The purpose of the bill is to alter the threshold amount for certain indemnity mortgage transactions. The bill will provide exemptions to previously taxed documents and will have an unfair and broad negative revenue impact in Frederick County and in other counties. As um, Mr. Canale said, the indemnity mortgage is simply a loophole used to avoid recordation tax. This loophole was closed by the 2012 General Assembly. At the same time, the state required counties to begin paying the cost of teacher pensions and the revenue generated from removing the IDOT exemption was part of the offset that helped counties fund that cost. Reversing the action um, while not adjusting local government expenditures will create significant budget tech challenges for counties. Thank you for your consideration. On behalf of Frederick County government, I urge an unfavorable report. Thank, thank you, questions for Ms. Fox. Okay, thank you very much. And that concludes the hearing on that bill. And now we move on to Senator Washington, um, <clears throat> Senate Bill 380. Good afternoon, Chairman and colleagues. Could my panel, sponsor panel, join me? Sure. That would be great. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. I appreciate the opportunity to present for your consideration. Uh, Senate Bill 380, uh, Water Affordability Assistance Program. Uh, water is uh, a basic right, um, and it must be made available at affordable rates across race, age, uh, and region. Uh, 
the Maryland Advisory Committee to the, Uni to, to the United States Civil, Civil Rights Commission uh, took up a study about the disparate impacts of water, uh, water policy um, and uh, the setting of rates across the state of Maryland. Right now, the way water rates are set, are, are, are set, the way our water systems are managed are very local. So they're municipal. Uh, you can have as many as, as 10 people on a water system and you can have uh, 200,000 accounts. We don't really have a, a standardized way to, to, to set water rates uh, in the state of Maryland. Uh, the closest we have um, is the uh, WSSC uh, that does manage uh, both the Baltimore, uh, uh, Montgomery County and Prince George's County uh, has a, a, a process for uh, a public disclosure, a, an opportunity for a public comment and sort of a legislative uh, way of setting rates. Um, so we do find that uh, individuals continue to not be able to afford their water bills. And we know that water prices are raising up. Um, in the city that I represent, uh, Baltimore alone has had over 40 water main failures. Uh, the EPA estimates that over the next 20 years, infrastructure costs are going to go up. It'll be some of the highest uh, you know, across the country. Um, and as of May of this year, uh, our Department of Public Works released a proposal to increase our water costs of 9%. That's not just happening in Baltimore, it's happening all over the state. So uh, one of the things that we'd like to do um, is to relieve that burden. Again, as the state, we don't have the ability to set rates for individual jurisdictions or uh, water works. Uh, but we can uh, reclassify the water, the the the, the assistance uh, that individuals get uh, to pay for their water bills as uh, not taxable. Uh, that is the case at the at the federal level. So that's what this bill does. Um, and um, I have it would require uh, that we also collect uh, the names of the water affordability assistance programs, whether it's administ administrated by um, a unit of government or a local government. Uh, we would be asking for a report on the list of the recipients, their A's, their tax identification, uh, the amount of water affordability assistance that they have, uh, and any other information. So we don't want the assistance that people receive from the state to pay for their water bills uh, to be added to their income and then taxed. So this bill is pretty, I know I gave a longer introduction because I wanted to give you some background because you're going to have another bill on this topic. But this one is uh, exempting uh, individuals who receive public assistance uh, to pay for their water bill for this, the amount not to be considered income. Um, so I'm asking for your favorable report. Um, and I have Alexandra Ferrari Campbell here, the executive director of the Center for Water Security and Cooperation. Uh, and I don't see Rihanna. Um, and I also have William Steinweld, uh, supervising attorney and foreclosure legal assistance with the Maryland Legal Aid. Thank you very much. And I'm open for any questions after my panel gives you their re reports. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. So you need to bring the mic over, please. No, you can pull it over. Yeah. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Alexander Campbell Ferrari. I'm the executive director of the Center for Water Security and Cooperation. Thank you, Senator Washington, for the opportunity to speak in favor of Senate Bill 380. Having worked to understand water and wastewater affordability issues facing Marylanders and others across the country, I believe Senate Bill 380 will ensure three things. Fairness, consistency, and access for those seeking water bill assistance. First, this bill ensures fairness for low-income households trying to avoid water shutoffs. Households receive water rate assistance to help make water bills more affordable. Often water bills take more than three to 4% of a low-income household's income. Without assistance, these households, these families, would not have sufficient financial resources to pay their bill, making them subject to water shutoffs and eventually liens should the delinquencies continue to accrue. 
Ensuring that water assistance is not counted as taxable income ensures households can apply for and receive water assistance with peace of mind and not worry they will be punished later with additional taxes. Second, this bill ensures consistency. There's already a lot of inconsistency across local communities regarding the rules and policies governing water access and water shutoffs for non-payment, as well as access to water assistance programs generally. Not all water and wastewater providers offer assistance programs. In fact, the majority do not. This bill will encourage all local governments and water providers to consider offering assistance programs by clarifying that such assistance would not be taxable and therefore create other burdens for households. And finally, third, this bill ensures that households will apply for the assistance they need and be able to continue receiving necessary water and wastewater services. In my experience, if families are concerned that assistance under one program will make them ineligible for assistance they are receiving in other programs or cost them more in the long run, they won't apply. This is a disservice to the household and the program because the household does not get the help they need and the program is not able to achieve the purpose for which it was established to keep families connected to water. Thank you and we encourage this committee and the broader General Assembly to vote in support of this bill. Hello, my name is William Steinwell and I'm a supervising attorney with the Foreclosure Legal Assistance Project of the Maryland Legal Aid Bureau. I'm also an enrolled agent um, with the IRS of uh, certified accounting professional with the IRS. And that is from this point that I am testifying today, uh, basically to give some tax background on, on this particular issue. The biggest concern that I had with this and why legal aid is in strong support of this bill is, is that um, under IRS publication 525, water bill assistance should not be considered taxable at all. Um, but however, from what I've been told, some jurisdictions are issuing 1099s to taxpayers believing that it is taxable, um, and this causes a lot of problems. First, um, there is a limit on unearned income for the earned income tax credit. Um, so if a person is issued a, and since water, since water assistance will be considered unearned income, if they were issued a 1099 incorrectly, that may eliminate or limit their ability to obtain the earned income tax credit, which can have a very adverse consequence for uh, low income homeowner, low income taxpayers. Second, um, if uh, this would also not be, if the if it was issued as a 1099 NEC, this would be considered self-employment income, which could result in additional taxation uh, since all since uh, payroll taxes for self-employment are, are on all income earned that is greater than four hundred dollars. Finally, a person issued uh, there is nearly there is over a billion dollars of unclaimed tax refunds every year uh, with the IRS, uh, mainly because people are concerned that if they file a tax return that they will be they will have to owe money instead of getting money back. Uh, so we want to promote as many people as possible getting these refunds because for every low income person, one dollar has a very, very strong factor. So we issue a favor. We request a favor report on this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> and Anyone can answer, to be honest. And I'm just kind of curious as far as some of the information you provided at the end. I think first, first and foremost, I think we can all agree how critical water is. We want to make sure water is accessible for, for everybody. I, I am a little confused as far as what is or is not taxable. Because the, the physical note was saying that, you know, federal and state income tax is not applicable, this federal state income tax. You were mentioning some other jurisdictions. There was some information the physical note about Baltimore City specifically. Is this just a Baltimore City thing? Are there other municipalities that are doing this? Do we have an idea who they are or what they are other than just other jurisdictions. Um, thank you, Senator, for that question. There is there are different policies depending on the in terms of how um, how uh, any kind of assistance is handling. It can vary by jurisdiction. It can vary by service delivery. Uh, so that we have multiple ones across the state. This bill is intended to clarify that from the state perspective that we should abide by the federal law that says that this should not be considered uh, taxable income. And to make it very clear, you've heard that mm -hmm. some jurisdictions, and they probably just don't want to run afoul mm -hmm. of the tax code or considering this as income. So it's not just uh, assistance that you get from uh, direct assistance, but um, if any portion of your bill is forgiven, right? So say you owe $1,000 or $2,000, 
um, that it, it, it it's forgiven, uh, then that could be considered income. So I, I guess I laid in the ideas of Baltimore City because I'm very familiar with Baltimore City and I've worked a lot in that space. But the, the main point is that the only intervention that we as the state at this time can have across the board for all Marylanders would be to allow, make it very clearly that this is not to be considered income. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Senator, for bringing this bill up. Uh, we just had a sidebar, Senator Corderman and I, that this seems particularly relevant considering the, the state funding that went into water assistance over COVID. Yes. Um, <clears throat> Appreciating that this might and not our electricity, but that's another committee. Okay. But yes. <laughs> Considering um I, I know you represent two two jurisdictions in the state. I'm yes. and just curious, could could you tell us if, if your constituents have experienced receiving a 1099, if you know of any other no, I'm not aware. State that has. Yeah. So okay. so one of the things that's great about um Baltimore is that we've really uh, taken the the lead as, as the city has taken the lead in terms of establishing water affordability well passing legislation to establish the water affordability uh, programs and so that has not happened in our jurisdiction. Um, however, I've gotten reports uh, across the state okay. that that has happened. Okay, appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and Brianna is also part of my. I can, okay. Yeah. See that. Thank you. Um, and we have on uh, the line, Rihanna Echo. Hi, good afternoon, uh, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. My name is Rihanna Eckel, and I am with uh, Maryland Volunteer Lawyer Service and the Baltimore Right to Water Coalition. Um, I have been living in the 43rd District and working on water justice in Baltimore for seven years. Um, and I'm here to testify in support of Senate Bill 380 because, as my senator mentioned, uh, Baltimore has a water affordability crisis, and having water assistance count as taxable income is acting as a barrier for tenants who really need support. Um, so the Baltimore Right to Water Coalition worked uh, with the Baltimore City Council to pass legislation to create um, an innovative income-based water affordability program called the Water for All program um, that just launched last year. Um, and for homeowners on this program, the Water for All credit is applied directly to their water bills. Uh, for tenants in multifamily units, we wanted to make sure that the tenants are seeing the benefit of the program. Um, so instead of having it be a credit on the water bill, um, which could be pocketed by the landlord, tenants are receiving direct payments from the city. Um, those are coming as uh, loaded debit cards uh, via a vendor called Equity. Um, but because the assistance is being issued as direct payments, the city is saying it is taxable income. So tenants have to fill out a W-9 form and will be issued a 1099. And nearly a year after the launch of this program, we're seeing the impacts of it counting as taxable income. 53% of Baltimore's residents are tenants, and yet they are staggeringly underrepresented in the Water for All program. Um, as of February 1st, the City Department of Public Works has received 3,630 applications from homeowners, but only 2,090 from tenants. Um, additionally, we have heard from our partners at the Department of Public Works that there are many tenants who have gone through the application process um, and been approved, but then after their application is approved, um, when they've been asked to submit a W-9, they've declined to enroll in the program um, because they know the impl implications of um, having this assistance count as taxable income and how it could complicate their taxes and potentially disqualify them um, for other assistance programs as well. Um, and so while this is currently a problem in Baltimore, we know that as our water affordability crisis uh, gets here, um, it will become an issue in other jurisdictions. So we urge a favorable report. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions for the virtual witness. Okay. Thank you very much, Senator. Thank you. All right. Next up, 426. <clears throat> Senator King. Okay. Senator. Senator. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman and members of the committee. 
Making public uh, higher education affordable and accessible has been a shared goal of the General Assembly and the University System of Maryland for many years. We have made great strides, but, we, but more needs to be done. Uh, Senate Bill 426 will authorize USM's Board of Regents to transfer no more than $150 million from fund balances held by the treasurer to establish a quasi-endowment, which will be used to fund investments in need-based financial aid. Uh, this fund will target those students who are just above Pell Grant financial ceilings, making them ineligible for Pell uh, federal funds. This committee and the General Assembly have authorized USM to create two other uh, quasi-endowments in 2013 and 17. I think both of those were my bills. And both have been very successful in generating funds for their intended purposes. This endowment will be another tool in USM's toolbox to meet the important goals of access and affordability at our USM schools. And I respectfully request a fav favorable report on Senate Bill 426. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, for the record, Patrick Hogan with the University System of Maryland. Uh, I'll be very brief. I first want to thank Senator King for again sponsoring a quasi endowment bill for us. Uh, the USM uh, and our institutions want to continue to make uh, higher education accessible and affordable for lower income students in the state, uh, and we want to try to help them graduate without debt. Uh, we have prioritized financial aid in our budgets, and we are very thankful to this committee and the General Assembly for increased state funding or financial aid over the last few years, but there is still unmet need. Uh, so with this bill, we intend to do even more. We want to invest our own money uh, for the purposes of dedicating uh, the income to additional financial aid uh, dollars for our lower income students. Uh, for more information on how we're doing that, uh, I will turn it to the USM's Associate Vice Chancellor for Financial Affairs, Celeste Denson. Hello, Chair and um, Committee. Thank you for allowing us to speak this, this afternoon. Um, we are asking for authority to transfer up to 150 million of funds currently deposited in the state treasurer to our endowment investment portfolio. The proceeds of this investment uh, initially, approximately $6 million per year, will provide um, support for students across the university system who currently have unmet financial need. Since 2005, the university system's endowment portfolio has been managed by the University System of Maryland Foundation. During this period, the uh, average rate of return for the portfolio is 7%. The endowment investment performance is reviewed annually by the University System of Maryland's Board of Regents. With prudent investment management and oversight, uh, this, the Board of Regents and the Systems Foundation, will, um, this investment will grow over time in a sustained manner that will increase the financial benefit to the system students. I am asking for a favorable report for Bill 426. Chairman Gazzoni, Vice Chair Rosapep, for the record, Ross Stern, Executive Director of Government Relations for the University of Maryland. Um, Celeste just did a very good job of explaining the bill, so I, I don't want to belabor that. Just want to say that the University of Maryland under President Pines has put a huge emphasis on financial aid, on need-based financial aid in particular. Uh, President Pines recently announced the Terrapin Commitment, which was a $20 million effort by the university to help meet unmet financial need of Pell-eligible students. We believe this quasi-endowment is, is another tool to help us meet all of the financial aid that uh, our students need. And so we urge a favorable report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee. Um, my name is Brian Acton. I am Director of Financial Reporting and Comptroller for the University System. Uh, I just wanted to echo things that Celeste uh, and the Senator have already said uh, by indicating that uh, this has been quite a successful uh, funding mechanism for the University System. Uh, the two previous endowments uh, mentioned uh, have grown by over 30% uh, since they were established. And uh, though much smaller than the current uh, amount um, put forward, uh, they have generated over uh, 
close to $30 million of income uh, in support of uh, their activities. Uh, so with that, I'd like to um, request a favorable report and uh, because this is a win for current and future students of the system uh, as well as the state. So thank you. Thank you. Questions for the panel? Senator Alfred. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And directed to anybody from the system, two, two questions. What's the current uh, status of the the, the fund? Uh, so how much are you, you're drawing down 150 million. So what, what would that leave you with? And then how is the financial aid distributed amongst the universities? Is it by, is it by population of the universities? Um, it will be, um, it will, each institution will determine how much they can contribute to the fund. Um, there will be a separate fund for each institution's share so that the money that the institution contributes will benefit the students of that institution. Okay. okay. And then your first question. What, what's the remainder in the fund balance after? Of, um, we'll have um, 1.2 billion. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Senator mm. Elfrith, I would, I would just add from a rating agency perspective, this is still fund balance because this is a quasi endowment and not an irrevocable endowment. Thank you. You're right. <laughs> okay. Other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Just for those who are paying attention, we're halfway through. <laughs> um, Senator Kramer was up next, 840, but I just got the word that he is still. We end up on another bill, evidently. So we will take 438. Senator Hayes. You've had a lot of bills passed through here already. Oh, really? <laughs> well, this is the most stubborn one of all. Let me tell you. This is the most stubborn one. Hey, how are you? Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, members of Budget and Tax Committee. I'm Senator Antonio Hayes, representing the 40th Legislative District of Baltimore City. Um, and you, you took some of my thunder, Mr. Chair. This bill right here is probably the most stubborn bill that I've had in many, many years. It's the, the bane of much of my frustration. Um, the first year this bill was introduced, it was introduced in front of EHE, formerly EHE. Um, and for the last two, this is the second year in front of Budget and Tax. Essentially, you know, in Maryland, we have sanctioned and authorized monopolies. Um, if you look at our state procurement code, there's three providers that are in the category of preferred providers. Um, both Maryland Works and um, Maryland Works and the other one, Blind Industries, I believe serve a certain population of disadvantaged individuals. Um, the, the third one, though, MCE, which is the subject of this bill, um, I, I don't think shared that same distinction. Um, and so I'll, I'll get a little bit more into it in just a minute. But um, it's my pleasure to introduce Senate Bill 438, Minority Business Enterprise Calculation of Participation Rates Procurement from Maryland Correctional Enterprises. The Maryland Business Enterprise Program was created to help provide equitable opportunities for minorities in business after decades of discrimination and marginalization. The MBE procurement spending requirements for state agencies was instituted with the same goal in mind, but the progress has been hindered by an exemption provided to agencies when they spend with Maryland Correctional Enterprise. Senate Bill 438 seeks to repeal an exemption that allows a procurement agency <laughs> to exclude from its total amount of procurements the annual dollar value of its contract with MCE when calculating compliance with the certified MBE goals. If we truly would like to create equity and opportunity, we see our minority businesses thrive. It is time that we close this loophole. Um, Mr. Mr. Chairman, members of this committee, I'll submit to you, um, in fiscal year 2020, MCE's total sales were over $55 million. 99% of their sales were all to state agencies. If you look at their annual report for fiscal year 22, um, their sales were just above $50 million. And over the years, since the creation of MCE, um, which by the way was created uh, 
as a result of the federal government banning the interstate commerce of prison-made goods due to the exploitation of people behind the prison walls, we, in our great wisdom here in Maryland, uh, legalize it intrastate, um, and we have then forced agencies to buy from them. But their, their scope has expanded dramatically over the years. Many of us are familiar with their products as it relates um, to goods. They also provide other services, but we're familiar with their products around furniture. But now um, they, they provide wood services, office furniture, lounge furniture, dormitory furniture, tables, library shelving. Um, they do license plate tags. They sew uniforms. They provide graphics. Um, they sew flags and gowns and bathrobes and um, a, a list of things. They do industrial cleaning and laundry, upholstery. One of the things that was most shocking to me um, in their in their annual report in, in 22, they had greater than $11 million in sale in meat of roast of uh, ground beef, chopped steaks, meatloaf, roast chops, ribs, hot dogs, lunch meats, sausages, like the list goes on and on, the different things um, that they provided and they occupy a space that mandates that state agencies must purchase from them um, before going to other places. And I think that this put us at a huge disadvantage in, in the amount of opportunities that may exist for small and minority businesses um, here in our state. This is a considerable amount of revenue that our minority business, businesses could have benefited from. Senate Bill 438 will alter the procedure for calculating the minimum dollar amount paid to MBE organizations. Only procurement contracts from Blind Industries and Maryland Employment Work Program will be deducted from the total value. And that that's I didn't include those two in this bill because I think they they provide a unique space in helping um, serve disadvantaged communities. I provided uh, with the help of my staff um, and Danielle Ziegler is here as my chief of staff a quick um, slideshow just to kind of illustrate a little bit more about like what this bill is actually trying to do. And so I'm gonna ask Daniel to go to the next slide. Okay, All right. okay, it must have been a little bit. Um, the 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 um, so so this bill uh, requires that each procurement unit um, include the dollar value in its contracts with Maryland Correctional Enterprises, and the total dollar value is spent on procurements for the purpose of calculation of units performance. Um, I, I would note you all, we all know that most recently um, the governor has um, issued an executive order wanting to know all the dollars that are spent with minority businesses and what their um, petition ratio has been, you know, what their um, participation rate as it relates to minority owned businesses is. Um, in the comments earlier this week from our treasurer, he has prioritized the spending with MBEs. Um, our comptroller has done the same thing. So it, it, we're, we're, in a, and we're in a situation now where all of our statewide leaders are calling on greater spending with um, MBE. And so I would just ask my colleagues that we also do this, but we can't, we won't have a true picture unless we, um, unless we include all of the spending. And so this bill essentially, you know, I wanted to break it down to the least common denominator for lack of better words, but what is the numerator? The numerator is the number above the line in which a common fraction showing how many of the parts uh, indicated by the denominator are taken, for example, three quarters. Next slide. The denominator is the number below the line, and you guys might remember this from grade school, is the, in, the, in the common fraction of the divider, a figure representing the total population in terms of which uh, statistical values are expressed. Next slide. So current calculation, currently an agency must take its MBE dollar value, the numerator, and divide it by the total procurement dollar um, denominator. But agencies are not required to include providers such as MCE when calculating the total procurement value. This creates misleading statistics, which may represent MBA performance being higher than it actually is. Uh, next slide. What does this bill do? So by including the dollar value of MCE contracts and the total dollar value of all procurements, 
uh, Senate Bill 438 increases the denominator, only the denominator used to calculate each agency and the state's performance related to MBE goal. The bill has no effect on numerator uh, value of MBE contracts and the subcontracts. Next slide. As a result, it lower, it has the potential to lower the agency's um, you know, participation rate. And I'll speak a little bit later to this, especially as it relates to the uh, governor's office, of small business and minority affairs um, testimony that you should have in your bill file. Uh, I, I would, you know, and part of their testimony is that, you know, currently the, their participation rates are already low, which is embarrassing. And I think that's why a lot of the uh, officials are calling their attention to it um, by including the money that's spent with MCE into the denominator has the potential to lower it. But I think there that then creates other opportunities for these state agencies to prioritize spending in other areas. Um, and so I'm not sure if that's a strong enough argument. As agencies are required to purchase available goods and services from MCE, the bill will likely have no, elect, no effect on MCE sales. Um, I'm gonna go to the next slide. All right, so essentially this is what it comes down to. I took you know, a fictitious agency, agency ABC. If, and, and if you look at their contract budget of $100, I wanted to use a real plain number. Currently, if they're spending twenty dollars out of their hundred uh, out of the hundred dollars they're spending on contracts uh, with MCE, that number is taken away is is not contributing to their goal. So if they're spending twenty dollars with MCE, tw and the goal of that agency is to spend twenty nine percent with um, with minority businesses, the twenty nine percent is based off of eighty dollars, not the not the entire amount of $100 that they're spending. And so that that equals about $23.20. Where on a, as, as it relates to this bill, what we're saying is the $20 that they're spending in MCE should be included in that denominator and the 29% should be reflective of all of the contracts that they're spending, which is $29, which is that difference. And so um, you all heard my testimony earlier, MCE is having sales greater of $50 million um, on an annual basis, that's a significant amount of money that could go um, to supporting um, some smaller minority businesses. Is that the last slide? All right. So yes, this goal, the, the, the goal of this bill is to enhance opportunities for MBEs and participation in state procurement. And for me, most importantly, to create transparency as we move towards um, making um, a lot of our spending more equitable. Um, really, really quickly, I want to go to the testimony that was uh, provided by uh, the Governor's Office of Small and Minority Affairs. Um, one of the things that they raised was it's unfair, it's an unfair advantage to compare to spending with MCE based off of, you know, in comparison to what they're spending with other businesses. That's true. Um, they do have a, a unfair advantage, but if our goal is truly to empower uh, MBEs, I think that some policy changes need to be made and we can't really get to the issue unless we understand like what the true spending is. And then their other um, argument, which I alluded to earlier is that it would lower um, the agency's performance and it does have the potential um, to do so, but as we put greater emphasis on contracting with MBEs, therein lies an opportunity um, that we can increase it on other ends. Um, lastly, like I said, probably this bill is had the greatest amount of frustration, third year introducing it. If nothing else, if you know, I, I'm hoping that uh, we could find a way to advance this and make sure that we prioritize um, spending with MBEs. But if nothing else, I think it is. Um, and coming upon us to at least have some budget language or something to have a greater understanding of how much, um, what is the dollar amount that each agency, you cannot abstract that from their annual report, but what is the dollar amount that each agency throughout the state of Maryland is spending with MCE to get a, to get a better picture and idea of how, you know, what disadvantage, um, you know, minority owned business. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I apologize for the longevity of my conversation, but um, you know this is really important issue, and I urge a favorable report for Senate Bill Four Thirty Eight. Get on your phone. 
Good afternoon, everyone, um, chairman and members of the board and taxation committee. My name is Donna Stevenson. I'm the CEO of Early Morning Software, and I'm here to ask for your favorable uh, report for Senate Bill 438. Um, um, my business is headquartered in Baltimore, Maryland. We're a certified minority-owned business and woman-owned business with the Maryland Department of Transportation. We've been certified since 1995. And this year, our business will um, turn 30. We're still young. <laughs> We've expanded our offerings and, and services from being a regional IT business to now a national software manufacturer, developing a product called Prism Compliance Management. So it's a comprehensive tool that cities and, and states use to manage their minority business programs and compliance software. And so in other words, I want you to understand that I'm an expert in this field and I help other states raise um, the uh, um, attainment of access to opportunity for MBEs as well as track their participation in contracts. So the legislation put before you as well as others and program policies are vital to create opportunities uh, for MBEs and to eliminate systemic barriers to contracting opportunities. If it was not for robust MBE laws and monitoring processes, MBEs would not have access to contract opportunities. So the Senate bill advances the purpose of the MBE program by including the MCE expenditures uh, and increasing the total uh, annual procurements effectively expands the consideration for MBE participation for departments seeking to reach the overall MBE goal. For years, the state excluded select categories from procurements such as pension management. But after awareness of the MBEs available to perform those products and services expanded, they quickly realized more competitive and financially viable solutions. And for that reason, I ask for you, your success, um, support of this uh, Senate bill that uh, Senator Hayes has put forward. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Carla Nelson Chambers. I'm the managing principal for the Nelson Ideation Group. Like my colleagues here, I also am certified among um, as a DBE, MBE, ACDBE, and SBR firm here in the state of Maryland. And I'm happy to be able to say that the Maryland certification program is very vital and one of the best. It's a model within the country. However, as a multi-certified firm here in the state of Maryland, it's vital for state agencies to conduct business with us in a fair and equitable manner and to report their full and complete numbers of their minority business contract awards and the actual dollars spent. The current reporting measures used by the Maryland Correctional Enterprise to calculate MBE awards and spend severely skews the minority participation goals that are set by the state of Maryland. Over the years, the minority business community has called into question if certain state agencies have truly met their MBE goals or if their approved waivers were justified. For the Maryland Correctional Enterprise to exempt or omit, omit the amount contracted with a preferred provider as part of their total co dollars contracted to us is just another way to misrepresent their efforts to meet the state's MBE goals. I am in favor of SB 438 and will, um, that I believe it will help to close another loophole in the calculation of MBE participation rates for all state contracts. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Vice Chair and committee members. My name is Tony Hill. I'm managing partner of Edwards and Hill Office Furniture. We're a full service furniture dealership. We're 25 years old. And I want to speak to how MCE and the current law affects businesses in the state of Maryland. Uh, we have not done very much business with the state of Maryland at all. We tried for years and years, quite frankly, for decades. And we found that we were spending so much money going after business that was not attainable because of the laws as it relates to MCE that it just wasn't worth it to even try. I want to tell you a little bit about how that goes. We'll have someone who needs furniture, it's being funded by the state, and they'll say, this is their experience. MCE doesn't do good work. They don't deliver on time. Can you please help us get the furniture that we need and help us to get a waiver? And we go through the procurement process along with MCE as competitors. And in one instance, there was a table that needed to be supplied and it, that table was motorized. 
And we had to have a table on site for the end user and so did MCE. That table that MCE was trying to supply did not meet the statement of work. It handled two of the three things that they needed. Ours handled all three. That table also was dangerous because of one of the mechanics that didn't have a fail safe on it. Ours did. I explained and demonstrated how ours would stop and not harm somebody's hand and how the other one would not. We still lost that bid. And I ran into that end user almost two years later and I said, how did it go with your furniture? And this person said to me, you're not gonna believe this. We still don't have our furniture. So it's difficult for us to try and play in this space uh, where MCE is concerned because MCE has labor that I can't compete with because it's prison labor. Um, I'd be interested to see how many of those prisoners that go through the program of helping to manufacture these products that they offer, how many of them return to society and actually get a job from what they've learned doing at the prison labor rate with MCE. I hope you'll be favorable toward this bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to kind of pick up right there at the end because that was actually one of my questions. And Senator, I appreciate you bringing, bringing the bill here. And uh, first, I want to make it clear that I think anytime we're having this conversation, it's a good conversation. We can obviously I want to prioritize MBEs over MCs. So I want to make sure that's clear. Being someone that represents an area of the state that has five of the largest correctional facilities, and we talk about uh, reentry and we talk about what those services are supposed to be. I have a, just, just more of a question as far as, as you've been working through this over the last three years. Where is the department DPSCS in on this? I, they didn't provide any testimony or anything like that. Do they really seem to care? Because, I mean, as you said, the numbers that were put out there are astronomical of, of the money that they seem to be making. And we shouldn't be doing that off the backs of, of our incarcerated and, again, impacting business business like yourself. So, um, you know, I'm all for that. I was curious what their position was or if they had a position that you know of. Yeah, no, in the three years that we've introduced it, um, uh, Department of Public Safety has never um, submitted testimony one way or the other. Um, I think there is some value in, in providing the skills to those who are behind, um, who, who are incarcerated. The problem comes when you talk about the competitiveness of the private market and what um, may have out there. And also, um, it, the, because they've expanded so much, um, they're, you know, they're, it's a significant amount of revenue that they're bringing in. Um, that money, as you know, is folded back into the general fund. It's not going back into reinvesting in training and other opportunities um, in a community. And so um, I think if they, you know, especially if they had a product that wasn't able to compete, if there was greater opportunities for other businesses to participate in that market, um, it, their, their margins of, uh, profit may not be that great, but you still get, you know, you'll get other opportunities in the community. But the it, the, the training part definitely um, have value added to those, especially if they were reentering. Um, what I've heard anecdotally, which I don't have um, any concrete knowledge of, and I haven't been supplied with the agency, that many of the people that participate in these programs have long sentences. And for an organization like MCE, I understand how that may benefit them. One, they have low labor costs. And two, if you have someone with a life sentence, you know it's pretty predictable that they're going to be there um, working for a while. Um, I, I don't know what the breakdown in those who have shorter sentences versus longer sentences are. But what I've heard is um, many of the people who participate in these programs um, have you know, pretty extensive sentences and they won't be returning back to the community anytime soon. I don't want this to speak as true to me. Anyway, I'm with you guys and what you're saying. I was just curious where the department was if they weighed in at all during your conversation. So I uh, appreciate the bill and, and look forward to supporting it. Thank you. Do you okay. Okay. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, did we? No virtual on that one. Okay. I think we can go back now. See that Senator Kramer has arrived. Senator. You can bring up whoever you like. Thank you for that, Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. Sarah, are you coming up? 
Good afternoon, mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, members of the Budget and Taxation Committee. Ben Kramer here to introduce Senate Bill 840. Um, colleagues, this is a pretty straightforward bill. Um, as we see- They all a, are, Senator. Yes, they yeah. are. <laughs> now, I've got one today that's not quite so straightforward. <laughs> It'll be in a committee downstairs. So uh, this one is easy peasy. Um, as everybody sees in our news daily, um, we have religious institutions that are under assault. Uh, the bill before you is uh, one of a package of five bills that I have worked very closely with the Senate President's Office to develop um, to address the increase, the dramatic increase in hate crimes uh that are finding their way to our mosques synagogues churches and um and assaults that are happening there attacks um just last week uh not that this would have affected it but in los angeles just last week uh there was a man who uh shot um at two men who had just left prayer services at a synagogue um, so, uh, the goal and the intent and the purpose here is to place, uh, annual funding, um, into a fund, it's called the Protecting Against Hate Crimes Grant Fund. Uh, there will be, a, an annual, um, uh, appropriation of $5 million to the fund of which at least $1 million uh, will be available exclusively to um, uh, faith-based institutions. And um, it, it really is that basic. Um, the language in here makes it clear that these funds are in addition to, they are not to replace uh, other funds that are provided for for this very purpose. And uh, Mr. Chair, colleagues, like I said, it's pretty straightforward, but uh, a very important piece of legislation to help protect all of our residents here in the state who very sadly now, and uh, it, it's a shame we have gotten to this point in time where we're here now, having to uh, provide security at uh, nonprofit organizations and faith-based institutions in our state, but it's the world we're living in. It's true, Senator, thank you. I, um, and I, and I, I wanna check and we'll, we'll check and see what other programs are out there as we look at this. I, Cause I, I remember several years ago when we were having some problems in <clears throat> Columbia, um, I helped uh, a group get a grant for just as purposes for a synagogue, for interfaith center, actually. Um, so um, we need to, we'll, we'll look into that, but certainly the, the issue is is real and important. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for bringing this bill forth. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, we do have a, a little bit too much hate uh, in our world. Uh, and I think, uh, unfortunately, uh, it's, uh, indiscriminate you know it's all over uh, i'm a catholic guy and we just lost a bishop uh to some uh, senseless uh, uh violent acts so uh I, I commend you on bringing this bill forth and uh you know let's continue to work together to chip away at, at this challenge that we have across the board so thank you Th thank you for those thoughts i appreciate it Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. I'm Sarah Mursky Mickey. I'm the Deputy Director of the Baltimore Jewish Council, which represents the Associated Jewish Community Federation of Baltimore and all of its agencies and our over 50 local area synagogues. We're here today in support of SB 840 because of the ever increasing rise in hate in our country and our state. The Jewish community continually is the second highest community in terms of who um, is at risk of hate crimes in our state and in the country yet in the United States. We are under 2% of the population and in Maryland under 4%. Um, it is a black and Jewish communities that make the majority of hate crimes in our states. Um, 
just kind of give you a scope of how much it costs now for security, just for the Jewish Federation system in Baltimore. So not for any of the synagogues, we spend over a million dollars every year for security personnel and for security before 2017, which is when the JCC bomb threats started, we were spending less than $300,000 for the same security. You don't see it on the news every day. You do see a lot on the news, but we continually get bomb threats continuously at our JCCs. Most recently, just about a month ago, synagogues still have people entering that shouldn't saying really disgusting things. We get suspicious packages continuously. Again, while certain things we do see reported, we've seen a lot of things reported lately about schools. Um, these things are still happening at an alarming rate which is why we need help and funding for security. This essentially codifies, we've had a grant program in the state for five years now, on uh, the Protecting Without Hate Crimes Grant, which is the $5 million program in the state budget. This allows kind of continuality of this kind of program um, to be cod- for, for it to be codified. So for this reason, we ask for a paper report on SB 840. Thanks. Um, any questions? Uh, anyone else who are, who are here in person? That we're here to uh, that signed up. Yeah, for chair. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the Budget and Taxation Committee. For the record, my name is Henry J. Miser, and I'm the co-founder of Safe Schools USA. Safe Schools USA is a nationally recognized school safety organization, which provides leadership and has trained over 100 uh, educators in the fields of school safety, school security, current trends, and specifically prevention of hate crimes. All students deserve to learn and participate in extracurricular activities in a safe environment, one without bullying, harassment, and specifically hate crimes. And while it is my hope that we might one day reach this reality, this is not a reality we've yet reached. Senate Bill 840 allows uh, nonprofit and faith-based organizations to be empowered and financially supported in their pursuits to provide security enhancements to protect against hate crimes. No student should ever be subject to a hate crime in the classroom at an extracurricular activity playing soccer. It provides a threat to school safety and security. Nonetheless, students are every single day, both in our state and across the country. In the meantime, the least that we can do is to provide resources to limit these interactions within our state and local communities. So for these reasons, and on behalf of the students of Maryland, I urge this committee to produce a favorable report. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for the folks who are here in person? Okay. Thank you all. We have two in favor and one opposed on in virtual, maybe. Here's one. Ron Halber. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Proceed. Yes, please. Uh, Good afternoon, Chairman Guzzoni and members of the Senate and Budget and Taxation Committee. My name is Ron Halber, and I'm Executive Director of the Jewish Community Relations Council of Greater Washington. I'm testifying today in support of Senate Bill uh, 840. For 85 years, the JCRC has represented the interests of the Jewish community in suburban Maryland, and now is a unifying force of more than 100 Jewish agencies, synagogues, and schools, serving a population of over 120,000 Marylanders. In truth, I wish I didn't have to testify before you here today. I wish we didn't have to spend so much time dealing with anti-Semitism, racism, and bigotry, and other forms of hatred, which has reached historic levels throughout the United States and also here in Maryland. Senate Bill 840 provides funding to provide nonprofits and faith-based organizations with assistance for security upgrades to protect against hate crimes, a desperately needed resource in these worrying times. I wanna thank Governor Moore for including $5 million for the Protecting Against Hate Crimes Grant Program in his 2004, 2024 fiscal uh, budget proposal, and to extend my thanks to our own Montgomery County Senator Kramer for sponsoring this important legislation, which simply codifies the $5 million annual appropriation for future budgets. There is simply no better or more important investment than the safety and security of our state's residents. Sadly, acts of anti-Semitism are on the rise locally and nationally. In fact, the Jewish community constitutes less than 2% of the American population, yet constitutes well over 60% of religious-based hate crimes. It is unconsciousable to think that incidents of intolerance have become so normalized that we are numb to it. We must be able to provide ample security to give people peace of mind so they can gather without fear and to make extremist bigots think twice before attacking us. 
We cannot put a price on the safety of Marylanders. We must stand up to extremists to attempt to divide us and stoke fear in our communities. Thank you for your time, and I urge a favorable report on Senate Bill 840. Thank you. Um, next up is David Burst. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman um, and members of the Senate. Uh, my name is David Burst, and I am the Chief of Police with the Town of Upper Marlboro. And um, I am here to express my support for Senate Bill 840, um, which I believe would bring tremendous uh, benefits to our town and our county. Um, you know, we have the bills, and I can agree with everything everybody else has already said that uh, we need this financial support continued because we have churches within our town. And as of yesterday, it's, it's interesting, I'm testifying that I had a church reach out to me that's starting up in March asking for security. Um, you know, that's their first email to me welcoming, saying that they're coming into the town and they're asking for, can we provide security for this church? Um, it's a Catholic church and we have Christian, you know, Christian churches and other churches in our town. But um, I believe that, like the others have said, that, you know, we're living in different times and that individuals are taken uh, to our churches as soft targets, and we need to do a better job of making sure that we can fund these projects so that they can uh, feel safe and make sure that everybody uh, can go about their life and, and they're free and worship and how they feel. But, you know, I would ask that you would, you know, support this bill and, you know, everything that everybody else has said, I wholeheartedly agree with, and we need to do something and help better Maryland. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for the virtual favorable uh, folks. Okay. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, next up, unfavorable is Vince McAvoy. Thank you so much, committee. I hope that you can hear me. I changed my gear. <clears throat> um, so I hope I'm coming in loud and clear. Um, the issue about crime uh, has to go with an actual proof of that crime. Now, we've seen in Pittsburgh horrid events, as one of your committee members just said, there was a murder of a Los Angeles area bishop. They're still trying to get to the bottom of that issue. However, what we found, and, and this is something that's been reported uh, back to 2018, Baltimore Sun, where there are certain players who line up first for these funds. And I object to these, this pot of funds going to one sect. I also object to the, the uh, misunderstanding about what the community should be doing. In other words, if we have synagogues or churches which are not being protected, this should be a first and foremost interest to the police department of that community. They should be getting involved at the street level and I can tell you in Baltimore City, where we just had a report of a church, Christian church of blasphemy, where we have not gotten extra attention. We have not gotten the kind of protection that we might expect, and we've received no funds. This is in the town of Baltimore. I want to back up just a second to violence in general in our state. When we pass laws or we coddle criminals, this is the result. We have this result because we have a legislature which aims more at appeasing criminals than at law-abiding individuals such as churchgoers. And that needs to change. Part of this issue is a climate being propagated in Annapolis and certain other activists in certain areas I know we have them in Baltimore City. I'll take credit for that. We have them in other areas as well. So lawlessness has to stop. Then we would have to, I'll close just by saying that if we end the lawlessness, we will face this with money. Thank you for your time, committee. I'm available for questions. Thank you. Questions for Mr. McAvoy? Okay. Mr. That... Chair, if I may bring to your attention, and I forgot to do so at the introduction of the bill, you do have... Pardon me, the committee should have an amendment that offers just some very clarifying language with regard to intent. So uh, just wanted to mention that. Thank okay, you. we will take a good look at that. With that, that concludes the hearing on this bill. Thank you, Senator. <clears throat> Senator Jackson, the Charles County bill. 
Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of uh, the committee. For the record, Senator Michael Jackson representing uh, District 27, which includes Charles County. Uh, the bill you have before you, Senate Bill 521, um, is a straightforward piece of legislation which establishes a property tax credit for volunteer emergency response, uh, first responders and or unmarried surviving spouses of the deceased emergency responders. This legislation came to us from the Charles County Commissioners and this is the Charles County Delegation uh, Legislative Priority. We believe that it will be, uh, it will serve as an effective way to attract and retain these important public safety professionals uh, to note uh, committee, uh, Charles County's uh, volunteer fire and rescue services. Uh, the only paid members are their ENTs, uh, EMPs down there. Uh, as you know, Charles County is a home rule county, and we require this sort of enabling legislation in order uh, to take this, these sorts of actions. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman uh, and members of the committee, I would ask for a favorable report. Uh, and I believe we have a panel, both, uh, well, virtually. I'm not sure if we have anybody in person. I think all we ha have so is virtual. virtual. Okay. Right. Thank you very much. Ask for a favorable report. Thank you. Very, very good. Uh, Commissioner Bowling. Good evening, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Um, come before you today representing the Board of County Commissioners in support mm -hmm. of this bill. I uh, don't have to bring to many of your attention the, the very much need for our volunteers, especially in a county that does not have a paid fire system. We do have paid uh, DES, which are EMTs and paramedics. However, the need is greater than what we are able to provide from a paid perspective. The volunteers provide that stopgap for us. Um, they're invaluable to us as a community. And we felt as a board of commissioners that we need to move legislation forward to ensure that uh, the volunteer system it thrives, has adequate volunteers, and um, can still provide that service for free. Uh, we proposed this legislation. Um, I know there was some confusion in the house with the amount of cap that would be on the level of income. Um, but as many of you know, in Charles County, like many jurisdictions in the DMV, um, we have a pretty uh, high cost of living here, and we felt the 250000 cap was appropriate. And so we presented it to our delegation during our legislative process, and they agreed to push this forward. I'm proud to stand here before you and uh, support the bill. It has no fiscal impact from a state level. We have been uh, working on this for a while um, with our uh, financial folks over in county government, and we're ready to take the um, take the burden of that on ourselves. Um, also, there was a study that was uh, conducted by the fire service, the volunteers, and the county jointly. And one of the recommendations that came out of that study was the fact that we needed a property tax credit that does two things. It provides some financial relief to our volunteers and also incentivizes our volunteers to live in the county and be hometown heroes uh, what they are. So I'll stand for any questions. Um, I know you have somebody from the volunteer system here on the uh, meeting. And thank you. Thank you. William Smith. Mr. Chairman, good afternoon uh, and all of the uh, delegation for your time today. Uh, my name is Bill Smith. I am the fire and EMS coordinator here in Charles County, representing approximately 1,200 active and retired volunteers. Uh, this encompasses 18 departments within our county. Uh, with an increasing call volume each and every year. Uh, just last year, all, your volunteers uh, answered 17,000 calls. That's 17,000 times these people got up off of their dining room table, uh, answered the call, uh, they missed their ball games, they missed their kids' uh, uh, birthdays, et cetera, to answer the call for service. Now, this legislation, uh, when you when it gets uh, through the system and is adopted, will greatly enhance our retention efforts here in our county. Uh, we have a dynamic system to where uh, we are recruiting and our retention uh, issues are are ongoing. This will help approximately uh, almost 490 uh, uh, volunteers that own homes here in our county, uh, and we would greatly appreciate. Uh, the legislation to pass uh, with that 2000, I'm sorry, the $250,000, I 
a cap as proposed. We, we would encourage a favorable response to see uh, Senate Bill 521. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. Thank you very much. Any questions for the witnesses? Thank you very much. That concludes the hearing on that Thank bill. You, gentlemen. And uh, actually, um, okay. if you just step aside for one second, yes, Senator Jackson, Absolutely. I know you got another bill, but we're going to let Senator Klausmeyer come in. And she's got, I think, one person on her panel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's worth voting. Okay. Thank you. Well, maybe she's got two people on her panel. Good afternoon. Mr. Happy Chair. birthday. Oh, thank you. Um, Senate Bill 435 property tax credit disabled law enforcement officers and rescue workers and uh, definition and eligibility and members of the Budget and Tax Committee. Senate Bill 435 is simple, enabling legislation to give counties authority to expand the eligibility of an existing tax credit offered to disabled law enforcement and rescue workers. Many counties offer a property tax credit for disabled state law enforcement officers and rescue workers. This credit is essential for many of those individuals who are forced to live on a fixed income due to their injuries. However, currently the benefit is only available to state agents and not federal agents, even if they were living in the state when they were declared disabled. Senate Bill 435 would require counties to set a definition of disabled law enforcement officer or rescue worker for the purpose of receiving property tax credit. This will give local governments the opportunity to expand this existing tax credit to disabled Capitol Police officers and other federal agents who sacrifice so much for our country. Two years ago on January 6, many of us watched in horror as the violence unfolded in the U.S. Capitol. The only thing that stopped the violent actors from reaching elected officials and their staff was the heroic actions taken by the Capitol Police officers and Metropolitan Police. Unfortunately, under current law, counties would not be able to extend this tax credit to the brave men and women who protected our democracy on that day. Every day we benefit from actions of these brave individuals and it is important to showcase our appreciation and support by extending this credit. I should also add that this legislation was unanimously approved by this committee in the entire Senate last year, but the two chambers could not come to an agreement on Sonny Die. I want to thank the committee for their consideration of Senate Bill 435 and would like to request a favorable report. This is the same exact bill. Anything change? Just a little bit, I think, isn't it new? Yeah, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Kevin Canale here on behalf of the Maryland Association of Counties. I think it is uh, mostly the exact same bill that you passed before. We appreciate that very much. We appreciate the flexibility that this bill provides, and we'd ask for a favorable report. And also, happy birthday, Madam Senator. Okay, thank you. I have to take a look. I, th I think it is the same bill. Uh, I, I really do. I'll, I'll, I'll take a look at it. But there are several of these bills. I'm not sure exactly. Okay, thank you. Oh, uh, Senator uh, McCray. Oh, he forgot my name. I did. <laughs> I did. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, just more or less a comment. I'm going to pile on and just say happy birthday to my friend, Edgy. Okay, Edgy. Go ahead, sir. Okay, we got it. <laughs> Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members of this committee. <clears throat> for the record, for the record, my name is Mark Cicero, and I'm a disabled federal agent living in Maryland. I was injured in February of 2010 and required three back surgeries over a period of two years to try and eliminate the pain from my injury. While these surgeries were mildly successful, I was lab labeled as disabled and unable to work. <laughs> While hearing of other states having laws on the books that allowed disabled law enforcement to be exempt from county property taxes, I was surprised that while Maryland does allow local and county law enforcement to be exempt from, count, from county property taxes via public law 3101E, 
it does not allow this provision for federal agents. It makes no sense that federal agents are not included in this provision of the law that allows exemption of county property taxes if disabled while performing the functions of their job while other law enforcement agencies are exempt. While military retirees with disability, even 100%, are able to start a new career and their new salary just supplements their retirement or disability retirement, federal agents are the complete opposite. Once a federal agent is labeled as disabled, we are given a portion of our salary when we are working. If we're able to get clearance from a doctor to start working in any field, we would then get that amount deducted from our salary for the rest of our lives, regardless if we continued working or not. Due to our geographic location, Maryland is home to many federal agents who have been injured in the line of duty, like myself. This tax benefit would provide financial relief for those that have been injured while serving our country. For these reasons and the fact that these men and women have put their lives at risk, just like local law enforcement, I believe we as disabled federal agents should receive the same benefits and tax breaks that they are entitled to in Maryland. I ask you in favor of this nonpartisan bill so it may become law. Thank you. Any questions for the panel? And I do have an answer about what changed. So last year, the House passed their version unanimously last, and then you guys passed your version. You guys couldn't come to an agreement. So the bill that's presented this year is the Senate version from last year. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, any questions? Is there a motion? All those in favor? Opposed? Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Oh, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. If anybody would like to stop in the office later, please wait. Thank you, Senator. Senator Jackson. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the Senate Budget and Taxation Committee. Um, for the record, um, Senator Michael Jackson, District 27, in my capacity as chair of the Prince George County Senate delegation on behalf of Senate Bill 833. This bill establishes the Prince George County Violence Interrupter Support Program Fund, a special non-lapsing fund to provide funding for violence interrupter support programs that use community-based efforts to produce, I'm sorry, to re uh, reduce incidents of violence in Prince George County. The Office of the County Executive uh, for Prince George County must administer the fund for fiscal years 25 through 28, the governor must include in the annual budget bill an appropriation of $1 million to the fund. The fund consists of money appropriated in the state budget to the fund increasing in interest earning and any other money from any other source accepted for the benefit of the fund. Expenditures from the fund may be made only in accordance with the state budget and money expended from the fund for the program is supplemental to and not intended to take the place of funding that otherwise would be appropriated for violence interrupted support programs in the county. Uh, the fund may be used for one, providing essential services and resources to individuals in the county as specified, two, personal uh, case management, three, workforce development, four, science, technology, engineering, art, and math, uh, five, mental health and behavioral health counseling services, financial literacy programs, et cetera. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, as we know, uh, we are all experiencing, uh, you know, we spoke about it uh, in one of the previous bills, Senate Bill 840. Um, you know, um, uh, we're at an ebbing stage again of violence in our communities, and uh, Prince George's County is seeking a way to, to supplement uh, and to gain some support across the state. Uh, as someone who's uh, spent most of my career in public safety, you know, I find these means to prevent violent activity. It's critically important for us uh, to continue to uh, find other resources. Uh, the funding of this program will be a means to that end. Uh, programs such as these have proven to be successful across our country. Uh, so with that, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, on behalf of the Prince George's County Senate delegation, we ask for a favorable report, and I'll stand for questions. I believe I may have. Looks like there are a couple people here. Okay. Come right. on, come on up. Panelists, come on up. Sorry, I'm, my delay of getting you all here. In any order that works for you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Members. The foundation is key to any organization. This bill would help 
forge a foundation in our community that started a decade ago between the nonprofit, for-profit, and community-based organizations and Prince George's County. Our foundation was able to provide resources that were not available during the global pandemic. Over 300,000 boxes of food, over 100,000 masks for those in need. We donated 25,000 rows of toilet tissue to Prince George's County for senior citizens when the grocery store ran out. The foundation has grown with the police chief of Prince George's County and County Exec for Violence Interrupters created with the Hope in Action program. Under the Hope in Action program, we created the Hope Collective. This group is a, a group of over 20 organizations that supported that supports Prince George's Down County residents in areas not limited to mental health, reentry program, job creations. And I would like to share a story with one of our parents. I want to first off, thank you, Mr. Chair, Vice Chair, and members of this committee. My name is Tiffany Evans, and I am the mother of the late great Peyton P.J. Evans. On August the 24th, 2021, at 8.21 p.m., my life was changed for the worse. My eight-year-old son was shot and killed to sense of this gun violence in Landover, Maryland, by a stray bullet while eating tacos and playing the game. Thanks to the staff of Hope and Action, other mothers and myself have been supported throughout the whole process of joining the unofficial club of burying a child. My son was not only known for his athletic abilities in football in Maryland, but he was a community advocate who enjoyed giving back to the less fortunate and seniors in Prince George's County. In honor of PJ and other children whose lives have been, who's lost their lives to, to gun violence, passing Senate Bill 833 will help fight the issues that lie in our community. Please give a favorable support to this bill so we can help make the future bright because every child deserves a future. Long live PJ. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you for sharing your personal story. Thank you. Hello, Mr. Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. My name is Jalen Wilson, and I'm with Customer. Sorry. I'm with Customer Relations with Dreams Work. Within the Hope Collective, there are three organizations that I would like to highlight. Starting with One Love Life Center. It's an art therapy program located in PG County and used to improve cognitive and sensory motor functions, foster self-esteem and self-awareness, cultivate emotional resilience, promote insight, and enhance social skills. The goal is to use the medium of art to create a therapeutic relationship between therapists and young people, which allow youth to deal with trauma or other negative experiences by providing an alternative way to express negative feelings, insecurities, and vulnerabilities rather than acting out in destructive ways. Another organization is Jacob's Ladder Incorporated. It's a general support for juvenile reentry and diversion program targeting youth referred by DJS, recently introduced to the juvenile justice system and release or pending release from detention centers and or display patterns of destructive behavior. Jacob's Ladder has demonstrated ability and effectiveness in this programming as they are already a collective member. Another organization is the University of Maryland Capital Regional Health Center. Their violence intervention program engages violently injured patients aged 15 to 35 while in the hospital to assess medical and social needs and provide intense case management on hospital discharge. The program has previously had success in reducing both trauma and, and recidivism and increasing job acquisition and meeting ongoing medical needs. The phases of services include stabilization, recovery and rehabilitation, custom community reintegration and self-reliance. For violence interruption, more resources are needed so that we can help more people and create effective strategies to combat violence in our community. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. My name is Reverend Cosette Thomas. I am the Program Administrator of Dreams Work, Hope, and Action Anti-Gun Violence Program. As we know, gun violence is a pervasive public health crisis. In Prince George's County, per Prince George's County Police Department, in 2022, 700 739 gun-related crimes have occurred, including homicide, homicides, carjackings, contact, and non-contact shootings. Dreams Work Hope and Action Anti-Gun Violence Project aggressively addresses the issue holistically with a three-pronged approach. That's with the Violence Interrupters, the Hope Collective comprising of 24 nonprofits, including hospital-based intervention and task force, which is our research arm. Our violence interrupters are currently working in the areas that were deemed by police, by Prince George's County Police Department, the highest risk for gun violence. Hope and Action Violence Interrupters work collaboratively with schools, youth groups, and community organizations to develop relationships with the residents who are at the highest of risk of being involved in gun violence so that they can detect and mediate conflicts, prevent shootings, and improve community safety. Our violence interrupters build intimate relationships with community members that are victims and perpetrators of gun violence to prevent and reduce incidents of gun violence. Our VIs employ, um, our VIs employ resources of the Hope Collective, including hospital-based interventions, mental health resources, adult and youth reentry services, after-school programming, workforce development, wraparound services, and um, all kinds of services that the community may need. To date, Prince George's County violence interrupters have impacted over 6,000 county residents and the Hope Collective, 25,000. Collectively, all three tiers of the Dreams Work Hope in Action Anti-Gun Violence Project has positively affected over 35,000 at-risk Prince George's County residents, giving more resources and opportunities to continue this work. Gun violence reduction will increase. Thank you. Any questions uh, for this panel? Uh, thank you very much, sir. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all. Step in the hall real quick. Oh, <coughs> sir Alfred. Thank you. Please. <clears throat> Yeah, bring up everyone who is, um, there's favorable, there's a whole another group of favorable uh, with amendments. Okay. So let's do all the favorables first. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Senator Sarah Alfred representing District 30, here to present Senate Bill 418, Property Tax, Agricultural Land and Improvements Assessments. Um, this bill, at the end of the day, is about tax fairness and supporting our agricultural community. This committee knows better than most uh, the pressures uh, face by our agricultural community, uh, pressures to sell to development, climate change issues, uh, cost of, of wage increases, all of those things. And this committee uh, has demonstrated time and again that we want to make sure that our agricultural community, community can engage in what's called value-added agriculture, meaning that a farm can grow hops and use those hops to, to start a brewery or grapes to start a winery, creameries, et cetera. Um, that is what's going to keep uh, ensuring that Maryland continues to be a, a hub for diverse and a thriving agricultural community. The bill in front of you is going to sound familiar because the body passed it last year. Um, we want to solve an issue uh, to ensure that those value added agricultural buildings are actually tax taxed as agricultural uh, and not as commercial. Um, while this chamber passed it, uh, there's some disagreements uh, around uniformity clause in the House, and so we reverted to a work group uh, led by ESTAT with the engagement of Department of Agriculture and other stakeholders. I attended a number of those meetings. It's unfortunate and frankly regrettable that that work group didn't result in any concrete policy solutions. Despite that, um, the group, the panel I have here, continued to work over the interim to find a solution. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Mako and MML, who will be testifying, who, who worked with us to try to find the most uh, uh, defined way we can support our agricultural community with this bill. So um, last night, many of us were at the, the reception celebrating this diverse community. Um, 
uh, farm breweries, farm wineries across the state. I, I met somebody who has a winery in Prince George's County who experienced a 2300% increase to their tax bill when they opened um, because of that, the improvements and the change in assessment. Um, so it's still agriculture, still one of the largest uh, commercial industries in the state. We know that has an eight point two five billion dollar uh, impact on our economy. Um, but again, we need to make sure that uh, the farms we have now can be the farms of the future, and that's where value added agriculture comes in. Um, unfortunately, uh, SDAC continues to claim that they have not changed their methodology in term methodology in terms of taxation. But you will hear from folks today, the community at large, that they believe their assessments have changed. Um, even if we can see the point that SDAT has not changed the methodology, uh, if, that, if that's what they would like us to believe, uh, I still think it's important as the industry is changing, agriculture industry is changing, it wouldn't hurt us to be more specific about our tax code. And so one way or another, I think this bill is incredibly timely and critical for supporting our agricultural community. Um, Mr. Chair, the fiscal note is a head scratcher, um, to put it politely. Uh, they fiscal nut writers have to rely on the departments and uh, SDAT uh, continues to claim that there is currently no problem. Um, and the words in the fiscal notes say under one set of assumptions. Um, again, this bill, we intended to be as tailored as possible. And I'll explain to you the, the few ways that this is tailored. Uh, we've worked with the local partners to ensure that local zoning is going to prevail. So a local a, a county or a municipality still has the ultimate say in zoning. We've narrowly defined value ad added agricultural activities. We've ensured working again with MAKO and MML that large wedding venues are not included in the legislation. And the most important component here is that in sh the improvements have to be on an actively used farm. You might hear from the agency today that under the bill as drafted, a brewery in my own district in downtown Annapolis that utilizes hops, let's say in the other part of my district in Southern Anne Arundel County, that under this bill, that brewery again in downtown Annapolis could seek an ag use assessment. Um, that's laughable, frankly. Again, we've tried to be narrowed and tailored. It's unfortunate and frankly regrettable that the department has not uh, been a partner to us in this work. Despite that, we do have great partners, some of whom are here today, the Farm Bureau, the Horse Council, Grow and Fortify, Department of Agriculture, uh, Rural Maryland Council, all of the partners who share the same goal uh, that I believe this committee and, and I do, which is we need to support our agricultural community. We need to encourage diversification. We need to encourage value-added agri uh, agriculture. And we need to ensure tax fairness and predictability for Maryland's small business community. So with that, Mr. Chair, um, I uh, respectfully request a favorable committee report. Thank you. Yep. Good afternoon. Matthew Boley of RWL here on behalf of Maryland's breweries, wineries, and distilleries in support of SB 418. First, I'd like to thank the committee for taking action to resolve this issue last year. We greatly appreciate your leadership on this. Unfortunately, this legislation ran into some late questions in the House last year. As a result, we are back with the modified version of last year's compromise effort. Now, with that said, you will hear some of the same concerns you did last year, including the size of the fiscal note, which just as last year, I think may be based on some faulty assumptions and a stretch of some of the language in the bill. Additionally, a question regarding the uniformity clause was raised late last year that has been resolved by creating a subclass of property for value added agricultural improvements in order to assure uniform assessments will be conducted of that property. However, I am here to stress that the problem of extraordinary uh, assessments in ag is persisting and they need relief. The farmers you will hear from next need a solution to this problem. The other stakeholders con stakeholder concerns you will hear behind us, I believe are well intended. I'm committed to working with them in order to ensuring our farmers achieve adequate relief. Particularly, um, I think we may, we, we, We've begun to have a better dialogue with us that in recent days, we've had some more productive conversations, but we still have a way to go. And despite that, we need to see a willingness to work toward a consensus and a solution on this matter, one that needs to be effectuated this legislative session. One other theme that may be present here is that as times change, as industries change and evolve, we must ensure that our laws, policies, practices, and procedures keep up with industry changes. Certainly agriculture has changed over the last 50 years, and this underscores why I think that SDAT needs to be newly directed on this matter. I thank you for your time and attention to this matter and urge a favorable report. Good 
Good afternoon. My name is Pam Giganti. My husband, Mark, and I own 61 Vineyard in Damascus, where we've lived for over 30 years. And after educating ourselves on uh, all things Maryland wine, uh, we were able to open our winery in October of 2021. We are an on-farm value-added producer. We're a small operation working out of buildings that have existed on property for years. No new structures have been built. We made the buildings a safe and comfortable place for folks to visit and enjoy our wine. Please note that we currently are open in the tasting room 16 hours a week. We operate under a class four winery license, which allows us to sell the wine we produce to visitors. After our open, after opening our tax, after opening, sorry, our tax bill increased dramatically. Why so much? We wondered, we know we had made some improvements to our building required by the county, like one half bathroom, and for the comfort of our guests, a concrete patio for outside seating. After we received our new assessment, I reached out to the assessor and was provided with the following information from Estat, and I quote, lands used to support cell tower sites, solar farms, retail stores, gas stations, wineries, breweries, or event venues, et cetera, are not considered an approved agricultural activity. The property must obtain permit, zoning, approval, and other special licenses by various regulatory agencies for these operations. Therefore, the land used in support of those facilities is used in a more intensive use and not eligible for the ag use assessment. So herein lies the problem. Our state assessor's office does not consider our winery an approved agricultural activity. How is this possible? We are a farm. I thank you for your time. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to have my perspective. My name is Tom Krogan. I'm the owner of the vineyards at Doden in Davidsonville. And just for the record, we produce all of the grapes. We grow all of the grapes that we make into wine. Um, you're going to hear, rightly, that um, that we should be concerned about the loss of revenue for our, for our communities. And I think that's... They, that's what they get paid to do. They should. So you should hear what we do with the money uh, that that uh, would go to this, otherwise go to this tax revenue. You should know first that my wife and I don't take a draw from our winery. We put all the money back in to the operation. Over the past decade, we've successfully sequestered 250 tons of carbon dioxide annually. That adds up to about nine or 10 kilograms of carbon dioxide per bottle that we produce, that's about the amount that's in a gallon of gas. We've improved the soil structure of our, of our land, preventing runoff and nutrients going into the bay. And I'll mention this again later, we've been able to successfully increase the vitamin C in the fruit that we produce. We've added uh, pollinator meadows and hedgerows, adding to the biodiversity, which some scientists believe is the greatest threat to human longevity. We pay a livable wage, uh, offer health and uh, retirement benefits to our workers. We've recently taken on projects to become zero waste, including the bottles that we use to bottle the wine, and to add a market garden. Now, this latter food production is really important to me as a physician. Our food system is, uh, is not doing us any favors. We see exponential increases in diabetes and obesity. 15% of Americans have scurvy. Now remember I said, we make this investment to add vitamin C to the fruit that we produce. We should invest in our farm system. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Colby Ferguson on behalf of Maryland Farm Bureau here in support of uh, Senate Bill 418. <clears throat> and again, we've been working on this for a while, um, and that's a short way to put it. But um, this is something that's been happening pretty predominantly for about two, about three years now. Um, seems like COVID caused it or something, I don't know. But um, the problem that we're seeing is, is that a barn that was built 80 years ago 
all of a sudden becomes dramatically more valuable when I change its use from putting cows in it to making wine or bottling, bottling my milk, retaining ownership and bottling my milk or making ice cream. It's still the same barn. It's still in the same location. It's still an agricultural use. But now the assessment value dramatically goes up. The property is not worth any more than it was before I started, bot before I started bottling the milk. So why is the price, uh, why is the value of that barn gone up? And you'll hear most likely again, because we had this bill hearing yesterday in the house, that SDAT hasn't changed their formulations of how they, how they do their assessments since 1974. Well, I'm, I'll be 51 this year, and I was two years old when they did that. So the, things have changed in, 50, in almost 50 years. The way we do things now in agriculture has changed. I, this is not a new phenomenon. Creameries, if you remember back in the day, we used to bottle all of our milk. You've all seen the glass bottles that have from Baltimore County or Anne Arundel County or Frederick County. We used to bottle our own milk and we send it out and everybody got it at their, at their, at, at their stop. We went away from that and went to a commercialized. Now we're trying to push everybody back to retaining ownership and the farmers retaining their, their ownership in their product and selling it direct to the consumer. That cost extremes amounts of money. And then to add insult to injury, now we're going to reassess them and, and tax them more. So we ask that we move this forward and get this done this year. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. For the record, Brad Rifkin on behalf of Maryland's breweries, wineries, and distilleries here in support of the bill. And I, I want to take a second and really thank Senator Elfrith for being a champion of this issue. Um, it's incredibly important to us. I'll quickly just read from existing Maryland law um, where it says, the public interest in assessing farm or agricultural land. Um, and it says it's to encourage farming activities to, among other things, encourage the preservation of open space, okay? And prevent the forced conver conversion of open space land to more intensive uses because of the economic pressures caused by the assessment of the land at rates or levels incompatible with its practical use for farming. So if we just take a step back, what we're talking about here is effectuating the interest that you all have already put into Maryland law for assessing these properties. And we really hope that it that this body understands that it's not 1974 anymore, it's 2023, and farmers need to diversify and modernize in order to ensure that that land doesn't become developed. So from our perspective, we sincerely hope that you pass the bill as you did last year, and request a favorable report. Thank you. Uh, Colby, questions for you. Uh, you and I were texting a while ago on this. Um, I understand the side. I, I just want to make sure. So let's say I have a dairy farm. I shut down dairy operations, moved to beef cattle. Nothing changes. Right. If I move to sheep, nothing, nothing changes. changes. Horses, nothing changes. But if I go into let's say a brewery farm brewery brewery or even cheese production then i'm going to get hit with this correct that's what's happening right now in a lot of cases i mean and i what i'm worried about is is that it's really happening when you bring people onto the farm so what's you know right now it's their target it's really been targeting the on-farm alcohol and equestrian centers uh indoor riding rinks things like that larger built larger barns but you know as we move forward with more as this is becomes more of the nature of the limited number of farms we have left in the state that they need to retain ownership to be to survive yeah, i think we call it agritainment agritainment agritourism we used in the house right so if you use agritainment or okay. value-added agriculture um if i if i start to retain maybe i decide i want to put a um uh, a creamery in uh, maybe I want to continue to milk the cows, but I can't make a living on twenty dollar hundred milk. But I can make a living if I can sell ice cream or I can sell the cheese. If I put that value added piece in there, even if it's exi existing barn, that now is being assessed at a higher rate, and it's still the same barn. And even if it wasn't the same barn, it's still an agricultural use and should be assessed that way. It's not. We're not creating WalMarts here. We're not putting in restaurants. We're, we're taking the agricultural use, and that's this is a very de narrowly defined that we are very, very much focused on those value added 
agriculture uses on a working farm. And it actually says about accessory use. This is not trying to turn it into an event complex and all the other things that we're seeing certain counties do. This is very much tailored to this one specific area. Okay, another question, Mr. Chair. And this is for, I guess, the uh, wine producers. So my farm cattle, if I buy feed or anything like that, it's tax exempt mm -hmm. because it's going to agricultural purposes. What about when you guys buy product to work on producing your wine? Um, are those considered agricultural exempt products? So when we buy for the vineyard, we get the tax break. When we purchase supplies for winemaking, Wait, say you yeast mean you get and tax, so forth. You said well, tax I'm exempt. sorry, yeah, no, we're, tax we're not taxed. We're tax exempt. Okay, so, from so according tax. to the comptroller, he considers sales tax on that to be agriculture, correct? In the vineyard, yes. Yes. Right. Because what I'm trying to say is, yeah. what I'm trying to look at here is, okay, Comptroller's office is saying, hey, if you're buying this product, I don't know, let's just say mm -hmm. this cup, and it's being used in your winery, it's considered ta uh, agriculture, so you're not going to pay sales tax on it. But we would pay for taxes on glassware. Uh, yeah, uh, on, I was trying to use an example. So I don't I have understand. any grapes or anything. Why making stuff? So, um, Maybe another another example. He's using my cheese and cracker here yeah, as an example. The, um, so these, I'm what I'm trying to figure out is, does controller's office treat you one way and SDAT treat you a different way with the way that we do the two different taxes? And I guess the answer is yes. I'd agree with that. Okay, perfect answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I was just uh, wanted to recognize my constituent from 61 Vineyard, Pam. When she walked in, I had to do a double take and make sure that I was actually on the bill. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And thank you, Senator, for bringing uh, this bill. We have definitely have a lot of interest in it. I just wanted to um, uh, ask uh, a question to see. We have uh, a lot of education uh, facilities in our area that are working farms where they bring the children uh, out there. Now, originally, when they, they've always been taxed as farms, and then when they started to get bigger and more counties started to get involved, they went ahead and uh, one farm in particular put in a kitchen so that he can feed the school kids when they come. And now all of a sudden his tax bill has come and it's phenomenal. And I love your bill, but it's got 200. Uh, if it's bigger than 200, well, when he was putting it in, he was like, well, if I'm going to have the, the children every day and they're coming. And so if, if we could make it a, a number of students a year that are educated there, that, that we could also give it that exemption. I, okay. I'm, I'm in favor of it. I just would like to do that. So I think we're getting to the heart of the, the issue of, of diversifying our agricultural land, and it's going to look different everywhere. Um, as long as, let me talk to our stakeholders, MAKO and MML, but if there's a, another narrow definition here that we can get to an educational farm, um, and we can maybe define that here, that, that might work to solve the problem, because in, in my mind, that's still an agricultural use. That, and, that, and we're teaching the kids from all the right. Southern Maryland counties. Right. right. In, Mr. Chair, I believe there's um, supportive uh, testimony from Department of Agriculture and, and folks packets. I'm not sure if they're able to be here today, but I wanted to point that out and thank them for their help on this bill. I know the new secretary is incredibly passionate about value added agriculture. In person, favorable panel. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have uh, a favorable on uh, virtual, Jane S uh, Sigler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the record, my name is Jane Sigler. I'm here for the Maryland Horse Council, which is the trade association for the entire horse industry in Maryland. And we support this bill. Um, generally for its goals and also in particular because it recognizes that equine activities are part of value-added agriculture and should be considered um, when e improvements related to equine activities are um, assessed at for agricultural uses. So we would urge the committee to give the bill a favorable report. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions for the online witness? Thank you very much. All right. Uh, now I'd like everyone who is favorable with amendments to come up.
Okay, can begin anyone. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. My name is Jonathan Glazer, and I'm the Legislative Director of the State Department of Assessments and Taxation. So before we get into this bill, I want to make sure that all the committee members know that SDAT has not made any changes to the manner in which buildings located on agricultural land are assessed since it at least 1974. There have been plenty of arguments that have been made to create a new tax break. However, I want to end the rumor that SDAT has changed our assessment methodology. Unfortunately, SDAT was not able to show up last year, nor even submit a letter to this committee to end this rumor, but we're here this year. <laughs> no examples of changes in methodology have ever been presented to the department or during the study or in the interim. This bill creates a new class of real property and new valuation methods to grant a new tax benefit for these properties. If the intent of the General Assembly is to create a new tax break for a new class of real property, the department respectfully asks that we have three years to implement this to align with our current reassessment cycle instead of the emergency legislation that is demanded under this bill. The department notes that this bill, as written, also does not conform with the recommendations made by the study that was mandated under Chapter 643 of the Laws of 2022. The department requests that this bill be amended to conform with the recommendations of the study. I also have Dan Phillips, the state supervisor of real property with me, who will be able to answer any questions with me. Um, and that is all. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Justin Fiore here on behalf of the Maryland Municipal League in support of Senate Bill 418 with amendments. You have our written testimony. I'll be brief. I think we're all relatively on the same page. We want to do something to help farmers that make value added improvements. The tricky part of this bill is doing so while getting a, a true understanding of both uh, the cost and then keeping those costs reasonable. Um, between the definitions as they currently stand and trying to apply a, a land use rate to an improvement like a structure makes it hard for local governments to truly know the cost of the bill. So we see the fiscal note at $300 million for local governments, and I can't tell you that that's exactly what that should be. I just know that I don't know the number well enough to sit here and say, we think we have the answer today. I'm committed to working with the committee, the sponsor, and the advocates on finding that answer. Uh, the option thrown out by SDAT to have a local tax credit also makes a lot of sense for us. We already define agritourism lo locally, to be able to define this and then create a tax credit option based off of that would make a lot of sense and would be a clear path forward for local governments in our budget. So with that, we ask for a favorable report on Senate Bill 418, and thank you for the time. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Kevin Canale here on behalf of the Maryland Association of Counties in support of the bill with amendments. I'll echo a lot of what my colleague, Mr. Fiore, just said. We're committed to working to find a solution here. Obviously, the fiscal note gives a lot of our folks heartburn. But we do think there's a path forward here. I do want to thank Senator Elfrith for all the work and the stakeholders. We've been committed to this for over a year. We're committed to, to continuing to move forward and find language that addresses the concerns of the ag industry. And certainly they do need to be able to be nimble. They need to be able to be flexible as the economy changes, as farming changes. And we certainly support the concept there. We just want to make sure we have the, the proper guardrails to make sure this is not abused uh, by commercial activity on ag land. So I think that's a lot of what the fiscal note indicates, and that's why the number is so high. I do think we'll be able to find some language that addresses everyone's concerns and move this issue forward. So uh, again, we appreciate the opportunity to, to continue to work on this, and we'd ask for a favorable report with amendments. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Glazer, what, um, I'm guessing that you said three years because you have a three-year assessment cycle, and but by the same token, it strikes me as, pretty long time to figure out how to get it going is there some place in the middle or quicker that you sure. can imagine it seems to me uh, well tell me why sure no yeah. thank you th thank you for the question part of the uh issue that we're having with our staffing is it's just impossible to visit every farm within the uh period that we have under this legislation to to visit them all um we would have to essentially not do the reassessment cycle this year in order to comply with it. So, you know, if there's um, a different number that we could meet in the middle, that would be great. But right now, our intention is to reassess every property 
either every three years or when a permit is pulled for $100,000 or more. Um, so if there's a if, if, if there's a different number, you know, we can do it uh, or we, we can try to do it. But again, our, our main thing is that we just want everyone to understand that this is a is a new tax break. It's not changing something that we changed before. Yeah. Senator Quarterman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Jonathan, you, you mentioned there towards the end that the there was a work group and that this legislation wasn't following the recommendations of the work group. Can, can you enlighten the, the committee of what those recommendations were specifically? Sure. So the recommendations were, uh, the first question the work group asked was whether agricultural, whether agricultural accessory use improvements should be reassessed uh, in a different methodology for improvements located on non-agricultural land. And the conclusion was, no, it shouldn't be assessed uh, differently. Um, as the attached report from the University of Maryland has indicated, SDAT is following the methodology that is similar to most states. The second question that the study asked is, if a different uh, methodology for assessing agricultural property use improvement is recommended, the proper method for assessing agricultural accessory use improvements. And because property tax exemptions are largely controlled on a local level, given that the county and local governments receive the largest uh, portionment of the revenue and to remain consistent across property type types, SDAT recommends that this remain a local self-determination topic for local governments. And then we also gave an example of this. Um, for example, Frederick County currently grant, uh, grants a property tax credit to offset the assessment of agricultural use improvements for agricultural property that has been placed in a conservation easement, a jurisdiction that desires to provide such relief for agricultural accessory use improvements should do should choose to do so based on their own self determination and governance. All right, follow up question, if you don't mind. Um, in regards to the physical note, I know that Emma Mel and Mako both spoke to that also. What to your what is the the you know, the bill sponsor put out there, the set of assumptions. What what is that all about? Like, what's the set of assumptions that's, that's generating this thirty five million dollars scary I, numbers? Got everyone freaking out about. I I really appreciate the question. So essentially, the bill uses a term called the agricultural use rate. This is an undefined term. So we're assuming on this fiscal note that the agricultural use rate is the same as the agricultural land rate. The agricultural land rate is typically five to ten percent of market value. So um, essentially you're reducing the value by 95% of the market value for those improvements. Last year, and this is also a higher fiscal note than last year's bill, last year's estimate assumed that this bill would only apply to non-agricultural buildings located on agricultural land. This year's estimate assumes that the bill applies to all buildings. As a result, the bill expands the number of buildings eligible for a reduced property tax credit. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is let's say if you were gonna you grew apples on your farm and you wanted to sell the apple cider in a building uh, in an improved structure on your farm is that commercial not necessarily That's not about as clear as mud it, what, exactly. what does and, not and necessarily mean it well, either, either it, is or is isn't well it it kind of depends on the what's there i mean we we frequently growing the apples is an agricultural use growing grapes is an agricultural use they're defined in comar for growing crops the same thing as the equine activities are defined as agricultural activities um, we have produce stands all over the state that we look at and we go, they really, they might be a pole building that's very minimal expense to put up. It really adds no value to the property. We'll have no, we actually notify them as NCV, no contributory value. They're there. They don't add any real value to the farm. So it might be that's the case. On the other hand, we have properties that, um, you know, we, one of the things like Big Cork Brew, uh, Winery. And they have a building that is as nice as any restaurant in this state. I mean, marble, uh, bars inside, crystal chandeliers, the big uh, parking lot that accommodates, you know, 100, 150 cars. Is that a commercial operation? Is it, how, how does that apply? And, and that's what we run into with trying to come up with the definitions of what qualifies for what. So we, 
um, property taxes or ad valorem taxes. We look at what does value does that add to the property for those types of buildings based on the features they have. And, you know, so quite, I know we had someone speak here from 61 Vineyard, her property and the tasting room, um, it's it's a nice little upper, nice little center. It does not compare to big court. They have vastly different assessments because they are vastly different quality buildings. Um, but there's there's a lot of that that we have not, um, I mean, by law, we have to consult with the Secretary of Ag, industry leaders, local government, in order to change how these things are considered. Is the way you determine that, is that defined? Because, because I, I can think I'm trying to do the best for my farm and my family. So I'm going to go ahead and build a structure that is uh, relevant to my area. And all of a sudden I build just a little bit bigger than what I should and all of a sudden I'm assessed at a much higher rate that not only did it cost me more, but now I'm taxed much higher, right? I'm doing the same product that I would have been done if I just did. Is that defined, the difference? It, it really isn't. Um, I like, like a lot of things with appraisals, private appraisals, assessment, there's a certain amount of judgment that goes into place. I mean, when we go out, we look at a farm. Is it something um, that is... I guess to what extent is it? We have a lot of small creameries. We have a lot of uh, produce operations that really we don't consider that they add value to the buildings or to the property. Um, other things that that are very extensive and um, and it's not based on how much they sell. We're not valuing them based on that. It's based on what structures are there. Okay, thank you. So let me just say to the committee, we're, we're going to figure this out. This is getting done this year, and it's going to be simple and understandable so people can move forward with their lives and not have a complicated um, problem as they, as they do so and, and build these, um, <clears throat> these, these, whatever they are, they're small businesses to, to uh, provide for and to, and to provide a, a really great alternatives to our quality of life in the county i mean in the state so we're going to figure this out um so we will do a work group on this and it will be done senator question so if my house gets assessed and i don't like it and i appeal it to sdat i think i have to provide comps for the area that you know i live in a three-bedroom rancher in this community and you got in, in you know these prices we're just using round numbers are at 500,000, but you guys assess me at 700,000, I can make that argument. How do you do comps on barns? Because I got to tell you, I've been in the ag business my whole life. I've never seen two barns alike. Well, and, um, and that, that how do you say, hey, you know what? Her tasting room and this is comparable to this in a totally different county. It's, I'm just curious of how, how you do that on the comp side. And for the most part, everything is done on, on these farms based on a cost approach for what features, what quality it has, what's it cost to replace it, what's the physical depreciation. And once again, just like a house that's built in 1920, it gets renovated in you know, hundred years later, the barn, when it has is renovated and has new features added, it get, it changes in value. Um, but we start with that cost approach. We typically then deduct off because it's, it's on a farm. It, it's not the same as a commercially zoned piece of property. It may require a special exception by the county, for the operations, but we start at that base and work down. We had yesterday uh, a gentleman that testified and he had built a new indoor riding arena on his farm. We, we picked it up. He appealed the value. He came and gave us some information. We adjusted the value. The appeal system worked. Every property owner in the state has a right to appeal. And, and, I, and I often tell people when they talk to me, if you have any question, file the appeal. It's your right. It protects your rights. And we can look at that and, and make a proper adjustment to it if we if you feel it's improper. Um, you know, okay. so that that process is in place as far as coming up with a comp, it, it's hard on farms. So you don't do comps on on, on these facilities. Well, the hard part of that is all the land receiving an agricultural use assessment. And when I look at a farm, um, I, I had a friend of mine who bought a, a horse farm up, up off of I-70 in Howard County, and she paid uh, $2.2 million for it. And it's assessed at 
somewhere around six hundred thousand dollars because it's it's got um, so much of the land is receiving an agricultural assessment except for the home site and the house. All the land under the barns receiving an agricultural assessment. It has an indoor riding arena. It's got a little bit of age on it, but it, it's drastically different than the price. That so that's the hard part about comparing that sale of that farm to the assessment because they're all it's already receiving a use assessment that's substantially lower than market value. Okay, thanks. Okay, any other questions for this panel? All right, thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate it. We'll be in touch. <clears throat> Senator Alfred, do you have another one? <clears throat> 424. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair, if I could be joined by my panel. Sure. Okay. Colleagues, uh, I hope this is a little uh, simpler bill before you. Uh, Senator Sarah Elfrith representing District 30 here to present Senate Bill 424, Public Projects, Global Warming, Potential of Materials or the Buy Clean Maryland Act. Uh, Mr. Chair, considering the impacts of climate change on my district uh, in, in Annapolis and the District of Peninsulas, I thought I knew a little something about um, how we, we got to where we are. Uh, I didn't know until uh, some, some small businesses in my community brought me this bill that one of the leading causes of greenhouse gas emissions um, is actually the concrete industry, which accounts for uh, roughly 8% of the world's carbon dioxide emissions, 8%. In other words, if the, if the concrete industry were a country, it'd be in the top five of global emission producing nations in the world. Now that's the bad news. The good news is that actually there are more uh, environmentally friendly ways of producing concrete um, and a number of businesses here in Maryland actually use those more environmentally friendly ways to, to cut down on the carbon emissions in the creation of concrete. So that's what this bill is seeking to prioritize uh, when it comes to public projects. Um, at the same time, other states have moved on this as well. In my testimony, you'll see examples in, in New York, in New Jersey, California, Colorado, Ohio, I'm sorry, Oregon rather, Hawaii. Um, and the federal government is also moving forward on this issue as well. President Biden in uh, uh, 2021 issued an executive order to require net zero emissions for federal procurement by no later than 2050. It's quite a long timeline, but that's okay. Uh, the order also included a buy clean policy for federal procurement to promote the use of construction materials with a lower embodied emissions through the creation of an interdepartmental buy clean task force. Similar to the work that this body achieved last year with the Climate Solutions Now Act, so this is just, I think, a, a, an, another tool in the toolbox of reducing our state's greenhouse gas emissions. So there's such a thing as an environmental policy declaration or EPD, and that's the tool we're going to utilize uh, through this bill in order to, again, uh, make sure that we are prioritizing or at least identifying uh, the the the. I don't want to say good actors, but certainly the more environmentally friendly actors in production of concrete. So the legislation as drafted is going to do three things. It's going to require a bidder on all eligible projects to submit to DGS for each eligible material uh, in this in this legislation that would be concrete, that EPD, that environmental uh, policy declaration for the project. Uh, we do also authorize the department to waive the EPD requirements under certain circumstances. Number two, it requires the department to set a maximum acceptable global warming potential for each category of eligible materials, again, concrete in this legislation, to guide procurement rules. This will work in tandem with the EPDs to ensure we are using cleaner concrete. We also require the department to update the global warming potential in 2028 and every three years thereafter to make sure that we are actually gaining progress here. Lastly, it requires reports starting in 2025 from DGS on anything that the department has learned, any obstacles the department has had with these requirements. Now, Mr. Chair, um, uh, this is a new day, a new year. I'm really grateful to DGS for coming to us uh, with some suggestions here to make it a little more streamlined. So if it's uh, up to the wisdom of this committee, but uh, working in, in hand with DGS, uh, they proposed a number of amendments that I, I'm happy to, to bring to the committee as we work group this um, to, to narrow the project so we can at least start somewhere and, and build off of there. So uh, DGS has suggested the following amendments, adjusting the timelines to primarily give the department more time to utilize this EPD striking the word facility specific and requiring the use of EPD project 
based procurement processes for projects uh, that are uh, also have to be required to meet the Maryland high performance green building standards that we passed last year. So really narrowing the focus here. Um, with that, Mr. Chair, we've set some pretty ambitious goals as a state to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. I don't know how we get there if we don't tackle some of the highest producing industries. Um, we have, like I said, folks in the industry here in Maryland who are leading the effort nationwide, and we really need to make sure we lean on their expertise and uh, really become partners in, in terms of public projects in doing all we can to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. So with that, Mr. Chair, I request a favorable report. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm John Favaza with Manus Canyon & Associates. I'm here today on behalf of Wholesome US. Um, we are a producer of cement and concrete. We have um, two major plants in the state of Maryland, one in District 2 and one in District 6. Um, uh, we also are a subsidiary aggregate industries, our uh, concrete ready mix subsidiary. Their regional headquarters is in Greenbelt. We have over 650 employees in the state of Maryland. I want to thank Senator Alfred for her leadership on this. She and her staff have put in an incredible amount of time in helping us get to this point. So from our perspective, what's this bill about? It's about better choices. Um, concrete's the most widely used product in the world. And if there's concrete products that are available that check all the boxes for, for performance, for safety, for durability, then and that have a reduced carbon footprint, then I think it's time to encourage more widespread widespread use of these products in the market. The bill's a bit dense. The concept straightforward. As the senator said, for a state project, it's going to require the submission of an environmental product declaration. It's essentially a nutrition label for concrete products so that you can see the global warming potential or the, the carbon footprint of that particular product. It's disclosed in a very transparent way. And we think that transparency is what is going to lead us to better choices. Um, Senator Elf indicated we're working with DGS on amendments on the bill or we're consulting other industry stakeholders, trying to address some of their concerns as well. I just want to make one observation on the fiscal note. Um, it was based on a Green Building Council study that was done during the interim. There's a lot of great information in there. Unfortunately, the timeline to complete that report was very condensed, and there are some things that are inaccurate. And the most glaring issue is that it indicates that no one in the state is using environmental product declarations right now. Um, in my discussions with the Ready Mix Association, there's probably 25% are using them now. That's going to be up to 50% by the end of the year. We're using them. Um, so we just encourage this committee, you know, we just don't want to kick the can down on this road, you know, down the road on this issue any longer. It's just sort of a gap in the climate change policy that's staring us in the face. So um, we look forward to working with the committee uh, on this issue. Thank you. Yeah, just curious, what does this do to the cost of concrete? Um, so Zach uh, Lovett from Wholesome US, I mean, I can address it, but he can address it better than me. It's part of his testimony. So, um, you know, we're happy to, to answer that question through Zach can answer it now, or you can just he can do his testimony or whatever you like. Okay. So it's not a incredibly straightforward answer. It's not in, incredibly simple. It really depends on how far of a reduction you would like. I mean, a 30% reduction in current CO2 levels for concrete is really almost cost neutral. If you wanted to go to say 90% reduction or 70% reduction or something along those lines, then it gets a little more costly because you have to use admixtures to overcome some of the challenges there. Okay. Does it do, are we looking at anything with asphalt or just concrete? In for this bill, I believe it's just, just, just concrete. Just concrete. Yeah. Okay. Asphalt's such a much lower contributor to greenhouse gases that I think the focus is on concrete and specifically the cement that's okay. in the concrete. Okay. Thank you. So, um, and with that, I'll just do my piece. I, my name is Zachary Lovett. Thank you for allowing us to testify today for the Maryland Bike Clean Act. Uh, I do work for Wholesome US. We have, as mentioned, a, a cement plant in Hagerstown and then multiple ready mix facilities throughout the state. Uh, I've been working on EPDs in the state of Maryland for about four years now. And I truly believe that this is the way the industry needs to move. It, you know, the US has been stuck primarily on type one, two cement, which is essentially one of the dirtiest types of cement we can produce for many years. As 
EPDs have been introduced and really raised the awareness of companies like the one we're sitting here representing today. It's taught us how we can change our behavior and what levers we can pull to start to reduce that carbon impact. And, you know, I've gone and spoken on the private side to companies very big and very small, many of whom are large employers in the state of Maryland who are are wanting EPDs. But my message to our industry in general for, for these last four years has been, we just need more willing partners. And this bill would create one of the most important willing partners in the state, that being the state itself. EPDs are a very transparent way for companies like mine to show in a third-party verified way. I think that's one of the key points here is that it is all third-party verified. You're not just taking the company's word for it. Uh, in a very transparent way, what we're doing and how we're able to reduce it so that you know what you're buying is getting the result that, that you want on any structure, project, or what have you. And thank you for your time. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Chris Clow. I'm general manager for Ready Mix Concrete at Wholesome. I'm uh, one of the co-workers of, of Zach. Uh, I'm also a board member of the Maryland Ready Mix Concrete Association. So, uh, and certainly this is an issue that impacts uh, all Ready Mix Concrete producers uh, in the state of Maryland. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to provide an industry perspective on the Bike Clean Maryland Act. Uh, I believe that the adoption of this bill can help unlock the future of sustainable construction through the establishment of a clear bike clean standard. Furthermore, an EPD requirement, as, as Zach was describing, would encourage better business decisions on purchasing low carbon building materials and impactfully reduce carbon emissions in the state of Maryland. Uh, one of the true real business impacts on ready mix concrete producers is the cost to go about acquiring uh, an EPD generator. Uh, you are really required to, to, to uh, acquire one of these per plant, and they're approximately about $15,000 each. Uh, there's also a minimal yearly subscription fee paid to a third party that stores and verifies the data. So most producers would need to make the one-time purchase of an EPD generator for each plant, and that's a significant cost. Uh, and the state certainly can assist the industry in making this change by making it easier for companies to overcome this financial hurdle. Uh, the federal government recently passed legislation that includes funding to assist producers in developing and acquiring EPDs. Uh, financial assistance from the federal government alleviates the financial burden an EPD requirement might potentially have and then additional funding could be provided from the state uh, to close any additional financial needs of the ready mix concrete producers in the state. So thank you again for the opportunity to testify and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Mr. Thank you. May I address Senator King's question briefly because I did uh, reach out as, as soon as I saw the testimony from MTBMA, I reached out this morning um, and I believe that certain, but the amendment from DGS can narrows the scope so much that we're really talking about. We're not talking about asphalt. So I promised them I would bring them the amendment as soon as we have it drafted, and hopefully that's going to eliminate their opposition. Thank you. Senator Solid. Thank you. Um, a couple real quick questions. I know there's all types of different concretes and mixes, of course, which we know, uh, between ready mix, slag, Portland, quick mix, you know, they all have the different types. But we know there's types that blend. So we know slag in Portland, you know, when you use both of those together, make them stronger. Is any of these going to affect in any way types of materials that you do blend or you mix, or is it going to affect any parts that are out there that's going to maybe hurt the industry? Because I know when we use slag from L furnace, which is not there anymore, you ship it in. So you check the contact and make sure that it's a good material. But are you making sure that the CO is lower? Because I know it's it's not as easy to get. But are you looking into that just to make sure that that is? I know it's a lot there, but I appreciate it. Yeah, I, it, it won't affect the materials we use. If anything, it will encourage more innovation on alternative materials to traditional cement. So those blends and things that we use, if anything, it would it would encourage more of that because 
for example, utilizing fly ash or slag yeah. uh, would be a benefit from a carbon perspective. I don't know. Fly ash had is they had a problem with that for a long period of time, and mm -hmm. now they're it's a much finer product. Yeah, but we, I know, we've come a long way with yeah. fly ash specifically and, and yeah. the quality. And we've got a lot of buried fly ash even in this state that we can find a home for if a bill like this passes, yeah. you know, and and essentially remediate that fly ash and use it to make new concrete. And it encourages would, that kind of activity, in my opinion. Would this affect in any, like any aggregates? No, because yeah. aggregates are such a small contribute. I mean, the real low hanging fruit right here in front of us is is the cement. And, and trying so, to come up with alternative okay. methods. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Very good. Any other questions for this panel? Thank you all very much. Senator Reedy, 408. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon. I know you all have had a long day with lots of bills. Uh, so I'll try to be relatively brief, uh, and but it is an important issue, and it's one that I uh, am thankful there's a lot of bipartisan agreement on. So I want to start with just thanking you for the opportunity, Chairman Gazzoni and Vice Chair and members of the committee, for the opportunity to present Senate Bill 408, uh, which would deal with um, tax policy related to broadband grants. Uh, the lack of high-speed internet, all of you know, has is, is been a problem in parts of Maryland. Uh, we're fortunate in our state that there are some areas in Maryland that are really wired and really moving, but we also have underserved areas. There's pockets both in rural parts of the state, including parts where I represent. Also, I know we have issues in, in some of our, our urban environments as well where folks are underserved. Um, the Baltimore Sun uh, reported two and a half years ago that an estimated 324,000 rural Marylanders don't have access to high-speed internet, and in Baltimore City alone, uh, 96,000 households lack access to uh, quality, affordable, high-speed internet. So in 2017, Governor Hogan created the state's Office of Rural Broadband and launched Connect Maryland, the Connect Maryland initiative last year to confront the problem. Governor Wes Moore is also committed to helping connect Marylanders with high-speed internet. I'm really uh, excited about the legislation he's put forth that I had thought perhaps would have been heard maybe today, but sounds like it hasn't been heard yet. Um, some of what I'll talk about in our bill is part of what he has. So I don't want to belabor points too much. I do appreciate Governor Moore's commitment to connecting rural Maryland and all of Maryland with high-speed internet. Uh, thanks to programs launched by both the state of Maryland and the federal government, there are grants that can now be awarded to internet service providers that can build and in install broadband infrastructure. But unfortunately, what I've discovered, I have a constituent uh, that owns a business, uh, owns a company that uh, was going to be getting one of these grants and found out that that grant is now uh, has to have taxes paid on it. Uh, so on the front end, these businesses are taking a major loss. And uh, if we if this tax policy continues, uh, for example, a business that would receive a $15 million grant from the state of Maryland to provide broadband infrastructure would pay two and a half million dollars in taxes. A business that took a $20 million federal broadband grant could pay as much as $4 million in federal taxes in just one year. The federal government, my understanding is there are folks working on this issue. I think Senator Cardin is actually one of the people leading the effort on this at the federal level. A larger company like Verizon or Comcast may be able to take a hit like that, but for a lot of our smaller providers, smaller internet service providers, upfront costs, just it's, it's a, huge, a huge hit on them. And essentially, if it's a state grant, the state is taxing them on money the state gave to them. So um, we want companies to step up and seek out these grants and, and get Maryland connected. But as I mentioned, it's particularly in the case of a constituent business of mine, uh, they, they were gonna make, it was gonna make it very difficult for them. And so the goal of this legislation is to remove that taxation at the state level. Um, the, um, the, the bill, I believe the difference, I think with uh, one of the differences with what the bill that the governor will present is I believe his covers only federal grants and we may want to be sure we say state grants in the law, but the governor actually in his proposal, as far as the line by line we've, we've looked at, he has sales and use tax also relief in his for equipment and purchases, which my bill is silent on. I'm under no illusions that my bill would be the ultimate, the end vehicle. I obviously, we, you know, the governor has signature legislation and I'm a co-sponsor of it, uh, but I did want to come present this bill today um, and ask for your support and consideration and make sure that I know a lot of the state grants, there's federal money flowing through them, but I don't know the tax implications of whether I think we want to be sure we make it clear that 
state grants are also uh, not subject to um, the state income tax. And um, yeah, so that is the bill. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Ask for your favorable support of the overall issue. Uh, and um, as I said, I'm a co-sponsor of the governor's legislation as well. So definitely enthusiastic about working together on, on this issue. It'll be a huge help for my community, my county, and, uh, and I know for many that are in this room. So with that, I'll stop and take any questions. Thank you, Senator. Any questions for Senator? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, we're just about there. All that's left are two of my bills. <laughs> and there's a lot of people signed up for them. I don't know if we've kept them all around. Um, <clears throat> both of them relate um, to meals uh, for students. Um, and uh, I'm just going to quickly just briefly talk. And I'm going to let the people who have been working on this really uh, tell you more about it. But 557 and 559, um, we'll take them in that order. Um, I think the the, the studies, the, the the work that's been done over the years um, shows how important it is um, to have um, children receive uh, a meal um, uh, in their in their busy or maybe two during their busy days um, at school, and um, that's what these bills have. The first one is a universal one. The second one is an in-class uh, meal. The, these programs have been going on for years and years, as we all know, and this committee is very uh, well aware of some of them. Those of us who have been around a little while have seen them all. I think the second bill, that program, I think started in the 1990s. Um, so, um, but there are gaps. Um, we just had this experience with COVID where um, there was federal dollars to do the universal program, and we want to uh, I think uh, continue that for lots of reasons. Um, obviously, there are significant costs uh, to this. This committee is well aware because it has jumped out at us in the charts of on the blueprint um, when we, um, through the blueprint, um, decided to um, require um, the use of um, Medicaid information to uh, tell us who is who would be available for school lunches, um, the numbers jumped considerably and has and added to the blueprint costs. But the bottom line is, all in all, um, I think we have this committee has shared for many many years the importance of these types of programs, and uh, we're going to start by hearing uh, the first one today, five fifty seven, and all those who are. Uh, here for that. Actually, I think I noticed, I, I may be wrong, some students in the back. And if there are students, I'd like to have them come forward um, first so they can get back to their their day or their night since we've kept you here all this time. <clears throat> now, you are you here to talk on both bills or one of the bills? Tell us what you're here for. And thank you for um, waiting all day to, to testify. Well, I'd just like to say thank you, uh, Senator Gazzoni and all honorable members of the committee. Um, we are here to speak on SB 0557, um, which is just universal free meals for breakfast and lunch. Terrific. I just want to introduce yourself and you can start. Okay. Well, hello everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Marcus Ross. I attend James Super Blake High School in Montgomery County. Um, I am a member of MSEE, which is Montgomery, I mean, Maryland Students for Education Equity, and I'm also part of the NAACP Youth Council. Now, I can say as someone who's been eating school lunches their entire life, universal free lunch is no longer a want, it's a need. I can remember in elementary school almost every day eating a cold cheese sandwich, and it was not only embarrassing, but ostracizing. I also felt othered and somewhat up, not up to par with my friends and my peers. Even now in high school, um, we have issues with long, sometimes overcrowded lunch lines, which not only pose a COVID risk, but also takes away time from eating and enjoying our lunches. Now, 
this can take as long as 20 to half, 20 minutes to half an hour to even get our lunches, which is absolutely absurd. And some students even just go eat off campus. Now, although that's a great alternative, it also poses a very dangerous risk. This past week, there was a car accident actually. And there was there have been many accidents this year because students go off campus to purchase lunch. Um, sometimes even hospitalized and in critical condition. Now, as a student who witnesses my peers go without lunches often, and some of which take parts of sports and other extra extracurricular activities, it's not uncommon for my peers to beg me to order them food or to buy them food from the school. The availability of, the availability of food for students is a pressing issue, but so is the quantity. We have to be mindful that not, all, not every student is the same and not every student has the same requirements as others. I can tell you that a single slice of stale pepperoni pizza is not enough for a student to get through the day, especially when said student cannot afford a side or even a drink to help round out the meal as a whole and meet all the food groups needed to keep the body healthy. If we as students are obligated to go to school and get an education, it is your obligation to ensure that we as students have the fuel to do so, to ensure that we are successful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Before I begin my testimony, I'd like to let you all know that today I could have woken up and decided to go to work. I could have chose to prioritize my schoolwork over, over this, but I didn't. I'm here today with you all putting my needs aside so that you could be reminded of what children in public schools are in need of as I am speaking right now. We need free, healthier, and equitable sized food for all ages in Maryland schools. Growing up in PG County, Maryland, while having one parent be more present than the other has been tough. When I think about the financial stress that my mother dealt with as me and my siblings grew up, I will always vividly remember mine and my siblings' experiences with public school lunches. My mother had to pay $2.25 per lunch meal every single day for three kids. The school breakfast was free for a while, but only if you made it on time. Now, I love being early to school, but with two other siblings who didn't feel the same way about school, that wasn't always possible. I had to wait until lunchtime to eat, but even then, it wasn't always certain for me to have something to fill me up. If my mom had forgotten to add money to my lunch account or given me money to pay for my lunch, I had no choice but to starve. I remember when I'd enter my PIN number, the register would always make a loud buzz for everyone to be aware that I could not get lunch that day, at least not a decent one. It was and still is to this day the most embarrassing thing that occurred to me while I attended public school. I did not deserve to be learning on an empty stomach and wait until 5 p.m. in the afternoon for my mom to come home and cook something. No child does. I'm not here to feel pity for me and my siblings experience. I'm here because my nephews deserve a free lunch at school. My whole community does. I'm here because I know from a personal stance how bullying begins and this is definitely a major factor. Lastly, I'm here today to advocate for what should be prioritized already. What, what I wish I could say is already exemplified in our state which is nourishing every child's stomach in order to ensure a better learning experience and environment. I'm Ashley Chavez, an MSCE PG County leader, hoping you take my words with you as you consider what is best for our Maryland students today. Thank you very much. You guys did great. Thank, Thank you. you. Really appreciate it. Thank you. It's always important to share your, your personal experiences and perspective. It's, I think it's a lot. I think we have a question, actually. Uh, Senator Alfred. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That was an incredible job. We really appreciate you being here and spending all day with us. Um, can you tell us, the committee, your plans after you finish uh, in Maryland Public Schools? I know we'd be really interested in hearing about your bright futures. Um, well, I uh, um, am planning on attending NYU to major in molecular biology. Um, and I'm hoping to get an internship this summer. Um, I'm thinking of joining Montgomery County's uh, Summer Rise program, which is really interesting. So, yeah. And there might be a few senators on this committee who can uh, help write letters of recommendation, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my plan after uh, graduating from high school is hopefully getting accepted into Georgetown, uh, into their School of Business um, or uh, Fordham's Law and Business program. Fair to say. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's great. Thank you guys again. We appreciate it. Okay, uh, so I'm looking for people who are in person who are favorable on this bill. <laughs> Will you manage all my bills, Senator? <laughs> Senator 
Mm. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Laura Hale. I'm the Director of Government Relations with the American Heart Association here in strong support for Senate Bill 557. We truly um, believe that students need healthy breakfast and lunch to be able to succeed in school. We in the state have set forth our priorities on where we will fund, and the great wisdom has been made to push for our children's academic achievement. We have set forth the task of funding a variety of things to make that better, but the space we currently lag behind is, may, is in feeding our children. During the pandemic, this happened. We saw great success because of federal funds that our kids got free breakfast and free lunch. Uh, but now that federal funding is gone and whether that parent makes slightly too much to qualify, whether because of the stigma students are concerned or whether uh, or, or being labeled the poor kid, children are not eating. We uh, have the opportunity to change all that with this legislation. A meta-analysis found from the NIH found that there was a positive association with diet quality, food security, and academic performance when families were able to participate in free breakfast and free lunch for all. Families are struggling right now. Consider the price of eggs. And what we found out of research out of Johns Hopkins was that school meals were a protective factor for our families in making sure that they did not fall into greater food insecurity. That meant that our families were able to, during the pandemic, have some stability around slipping further into food insecurity or further into poverty because of having free breakfast and free lunch. We would never think of charging a child to ride the bus or for, uh, for textbooks to do well in school. Why are we charging them for lunch and breakfast, a necessity they need to succeed in school? The American Heart Association urges a favorable report. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I'm Elizabeth Sachs, the Deputy County Administrative Officer for Health and Community Services for Baltimore County Executive Johnny Olszewski, and I'm pleased to be here today to testify in full support of SB 557. As many of you know, as a father and former educator, the county executive has been long committed to reducing hunger in our schools. And when the pandemic hit in March of 2020, we did everything we could, beginning with daily calls with our team, as well as BCPS, to coordinate food distribution and support the school system's efforts to get foods to kids during the week while schools were shut down. The county set up weekend food to cover the non-school no non -school days. And when the USDA started universal meals during that period, it was a game changer. It removed the administrative barriers. It allowed BCPS to stand up outdoor distribution at school sites. They took their bus fleet in the communities, all of which was doable because there was this universal meal program. And we really can't turn the clock back. I mean, it's 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 so important. Um, universal meals was needed before the pandemic and it's even more critical now. In fact, in Baltimore County, the number of students who qualify for free and reduced meals has increased substantially since 2018. We're now at 63% of students who are farms eligible. We also know um, that hungry kids can't focus, they can't learn. It contributes to the mental health stressors that have faced all of us and many of our students since the pandemic. So while the county has leveraged our ARPA dollars to expand summer SNAP, to encourage access to WIC, to distribute food, we continued with federal dollars to distribute food up until a few months ago when the federal funding one at, ran out. We can't do it alone. We really need state support to continue this universal meal program for the students, their families, and our community. So can't urge you enough um, to please request favorable for SB 557. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Megan Doran. I am the Director of Food Nutrition Services for St. Mary's County Public Schools, and I'm also the current president of the Maryland School Nutrition Association. I am here to urge you to please consider supporting this bill, SB 557. As many people have stated already, the importance of this bill is very significant. I am here representing 21 active chapters of the Maryland State Association, and we just urge you to please consider everything that has been already stated to you. The stigma is there. As she stated, our, our, our county, St. Mary's County, went from a 32% free and reduced number to 40% this year. That is very, very significant. 
for our county and quite shocking. It's we're we are a smaller county, um, but that's a total of 1400 students. We only have 18,000 18, students in our schools. In one year, from last year to this year, we went from 32 to 40. Our negative debt has increased $2,000 a week. That, that is very significant. The need is still there. The kids still need our nourishment. As we all sit here, as we're after five o'clock, we've had lunch around, what, 11? We're all hungry. Our focus has gone down. It's the same for students. I say to my own children who say, mom, there's this kid that pushes me in the lunch line every day. I say, how many times did you eat once you got home from school? You ate three times. You had a snack, you had dinner, you had a snack after, after sports. Some of these kids, the only meals that they get are at school. They got used to the universal feeding that we had where everyone was free. They could go, to, go through that lunch line. They could get breakfast. Our breakfast participation has gone down over 20%. Because now they know that breakfast, the kids that are receiving the breakfast, they're the free kids. And that, that's, that can really damage a child's learning ability. So I do urge you in support of this bill um, on behalf of the Maryland School Nutrition Association. Thank you. Thank you, Senators. I'm Jeff Pru. I'm Chief Operating Officer for Washington County Public Schools, former past president of the Maryland School Nutrition Association. Uh, and I urge your support of Senate Bill 557. And I think your words, Mr. Chair, to open uh, are very telling for us and the food service community, how much uh, you and this committee deeply care about this, this particular mission and about this bill and how important it is to the students of the state of Maryland. And I want to quantify something for you, to, just something to think about. The maximum gross annual income for a household of three, for sake of assumption, let's say it's a single parent with two children, to not qualify for reduced price meals is $42,606 annually, roughly $820 per week, and that's gross, that's not take home pay. To, to feed those two children lunch every day at a Maryland school is somewhere between $20 and $25, depending on the price uh, charged in each LEA. That's significant for households. Uh, these, are the, these are the working families that are really living in poverty in this state that really need your assistance. Uh, recently at a round table with students with our food service department, a ninth grade student at Hagerstown High School, and I think you heard this from the students earlier, noted that some of her friends don't eat lunch because they don't qualify and they simply can't afford it. And they're bypassing lunch during the school day. As schools, we provide materials, textbooks, computers, transportation, all costs that the state provides funding for, yet we don't provide funding for meals. This bill addresses that, that void in our system uh, and I urge you uh, to provide a favorable report on 557. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Elizabeth Marchetta, and I'm the Food Service Director for Baltimore City Public Schools. Uh, we are here to testify in support of this bill, 557. We have been fortunate enough in Baltimore City to be able to feed universal free meals to students since 2015 without requiring a household application. And we have seen firsthand pre-pandemic the positive impact that this has had on our students. Free community eligibility, we already had 84% of our students qualifying for free meals. But when we were able to move to feeding all kids for free without household applications, we served 10,000 more lunches every single day in that first year. It is significant. Um, a study by Hopkins School of Public Health compared schools in Baltimore City and schools in Montgomery County that had similar poverty levels. And they found that households in Baltimore City had um, the odds of food insecurity were less than half of what they were for the families in Montgomery County attending schools of the same poverty level, in great part due to us being able to provide free meals to our students. Uh, we urge a favorable report for this because this is important for every student in our state. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for this panel? Thank you all very much. Appreciate it. If there's anyone else in the audience, who is here to testify in favor of this bill? Come on up right now. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. What? Uh, we'll get, I'm going to do the second one uh, after this. We'll do them separate. Sorry, we are doing them both, but I'm going to do. Uh, I'm sorry if I was confusing about that. 
we will do on the on um, five fifty nine after this. <clears throat> All right. Oh, I'm sorry, Senator Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for this uh, this piece of legislation. I can tell you that um, you know during the pandemic and shortly thereafter, or as we begin to round the corner more than one time about the ending of the pandemic. Uh, the three school systems that I'm associated with uh, had concerns about uh, how are we going to feed these young people uh, after we get through this. And they saw the uh, the uh, the number of children who uh, and mm -hmm. families who, uh, you know, reached out and and uh, appreciated uh, the services that we provided. Now, and, and I'll tell you, as a as a, uh, a young person, you know, we really don't know what families go through. It could be any reason why a kid or family can't afford it. They may not necessarily be uh, a low income family. You know, one of the, uh, someone may be sick in the family. And as a person who grew up a period of my life having to carry um, a lunch ticket, I can tell you uh, the stigma that goes with that. Um, and uh, and hopefully, um, you know, what we're doing here today can, can help uh, families feel comfortable about who they are, what they are, uh, and get our young people uh, be able to focus and uh, have a healthy meal, uh, live a healthy life, uh, and uh, you know meet the real challenges of life. Uh, and uh, so, just wanted to add that uh, you know some of us know what we're talking about here. So, thank you. Thank you. So All right. Good evening, members of the committee. Um, my name is Samantha Zwirling. I'm here on behalf of MSCA, representing 75,000 educators. Um, I want to first thank the committee for all you have done over the past almost 10 years on this topic. We've made a lot of progress expanding breakfast and lunch, and this is the next step universal school meals. This is something that MSEA is in strong support of. Um, we are the educators who have to look those students in the eyes when they don't have lunch. And these are the educators who are keeping pantries full, stocked with food to make sure their students can continue to learn. This committee knows very well that we just identified 110,000 more students um, who are eligible for free and reduced price meals. And I think all of us see the need is really here. Um, you know, to quote our president, um, hungry kids can't learn. Um, and at the end of the day, we've done a lot um, in the General Assembly to look at how we can get, you know, our math and our reading scores up and working on the blueprint. Um, but at the end of the day, if our students can't concentrate, they are not able um, to learn. And so, you know, we thank the committee for this work. Um, I will also just mention, um, you know, this is a bill that MSCA and MABE are both in partnership in favor of. I <laughs> testified with John Willems across the street earlier today. Um, and as he pointed out also, you know, there's nowhere else like with textbooks or anything like that where we do a means test, essentially. We don't do that with busing. We don't do that with um, with our textbooks. And so why are we doing that with meals, which are so consequential to how our students can learn? So with that, I urge a favorable committee, uh, a favorable report on this bill. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you because I know you were there doing some of this 10 years ago. And we appreciate that. Great. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Julia Gross, and I am here on behalf of Maryland Hunger Solutions in support of this bill. Um, for all of the reasons that we've heard from our wonderful panelists and will continue to hear down the line, uh, one of the first calls that I got as an anti-hunger advocate working on child nutrition was from a single mother whose six-year-old daughter had been going through the lunch line in her school for an entire month having her meal taken away from her, thrown out and replaced with a cold cheese sandwich because of her school meal debt. Um, and the question that she asked was simply, how can we make sure this never happens again? And while I know our incredible school nutrition professionals work day in and day out to make sure that never happens, the truth is we will never get rid of the burden of school meal debt or the stigma associated with these programs until we stop using the tiered payment system that we are currently using. 
because this system allows way too many kids to fall through the cracks, whether they are eligible and not able to apply because of language barriers or fear or stigma, um, or whether they live above that incredibly low threshold and are still struggling to make ends meet but don't receive any assistance for these meals. Um, the current system places that burden of these flaws on our families that are struggling and the school systems, the school nutrition programs that are working on a razor thin margin to make ends meet as well. Um, this bill helps lift the burden on both sides. It's an important investment in our students, our education system, as well as these vital nutrition programs that help our families and our communities uh, feed our kids. So I will conclude by saying that hungry kids can't wait. And now is the time to make this bill happen. So I uh, respectfully urge a favorable report on this bill. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, members of the committee. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak. My name is Dr. Susan Gross. I'm an associate scientist in the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, Department of Population and Family Reproductive Health. And I'm also a nutritionist with the Johns Hopkins WIC program. I want to talk to you a little bit about my research. Starting, I, to start with, I want to say that I've been looking at the impact of the community eligibility provision since 2015. The community eligibility CEP is um, a pilot of what we would see with free meals for all. It looked at districts that had universal free meals and compared it to matched schools in other districts eligible. And we found a two-fold decrease in food insecurity in the schools, in the families of the schools that had CEP. This is a big impact. We also saw less aggressive behavior. We saw le better school um, attendance and better um, meal participation. In 2000 and 2001, we had a nice natural experiment. We had all kids across the country having free um, meals. The kids would could come to school and families would not have to worry about whether they got a meal or um, breakfast or lunch. And our schools in Maryland did great. In fact, they went above and beyond. They were able to distribute give, um, the meals to all the students in Maryland during the school year. And they did a great job of distributing meals during the summer. Then in 2022, this went away. I am just um, concerned because hungry students cannot learn. But I want to tell you a little bit from my nutritionist background. Hunger causes aggressive behavior because of fight or flight reflex. Hungry kids could be either more afraid or more um, aggressive. I hope for your favorable report. Thank you for your time. You know, and I hear what you're saying, and I agree with you a thousand percent. I'm going to support this bill. But the one thing that bothers me, I've been over to my granddaughter's school for lunch several times in the last two years, three years. And the amount of food that the kids throw away is absolutely appalling. And I think a lot of it, if you talk to the kids, it takes it doesn't have any taste to it. And I know it's nutritious and that's really good. But if the kids are throwing it away, it's not helping anybody. So I just I just think we have to find some kind of a solution to that. Because just go in and look. It's not just my granddaughter's school. They throw tons of, of food away. I don't know the answer. You want me to respond to something? You can respond if you like. So we do know about food waste, and we know that our school meals must follow the dietary guidelines for Americans. And some of those, um, but it's also that our school meals are um, mass produced. And sometimes it's hard when you have multiple shifts of children coming through the school lines to keep everything warm. Also, when you don't have that, things that keeps food tasting good are salt and fat. Well, we limit those things because of the dietary guidelines. So to keep things flavorful, we use herbs and other fit flavor enhancers that are natural, but they fade with time. So it's a question of how much time it takes to serve the meals. There are grants out there from USDA to have more scratch 
cooking kitchens in every school and we can apply for those. But also with the increased demand of um, meals, we can do a better job of supplying higher quality meals to all our kids. I understand. I'm not. I'm just not criticizing you by any means. I'm just saying I've been in the schools and 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 I just think there needs to be some solution to that. Can I add an answer to that? A perspective of a parent that's also sat down with their kids and ate with them. Um, the lunch time is not enough. I went through the line with my kid and I have to check everyone to make sure they qualify. I sat down with my kid. He had 11 minutes to eat as a kindergartner before they said, okay, time's up. Throw your throw everything away. Guess what got thrown away? Food. He couldn't eat in 11 minutes. So that's a whole nother topic. And uh, maybe this could help that by reducing the level of um, paperwork. I just want to add to that, that we do know from, okay. To add to that, the cafeteria environment does impact the ability of kids, especially our littlest kids to eat. So noise, time, and crowding all distract our kids. So it's it's something we also have to deal with. That's okay. It's all good. Go, go ahead, ma'am. Um, good afternoon. Thanks for having me. My name is Laura Stewart. I'm here representing Free State PTA, which represents over 50,000 volunteer members and families in over 500 public schools. It is our statewide PTA. We are here to support Senate Bill 557 because it aligns with Free State legislative agenda by ensuring children receive nutritional support they need with compassion and dignity, regardless of the ability to pay for school meals. National PTA also supports federal and state funding programs that implement universal free school meals for all students, regardless of income levels. This legislation is an essential investment for the health and academic success of Maryland students. The COVID-19 pandemic has caused the perfect storm for food insecurity. Keeping a child's lunch account up to date can be a struggle for parents. There have been reports of children skipping meals because they have a lunch debt. I heard about a first grader that refused to get lunch because he wouldn't want his parents to increase their debt. I testified it at our local board of education. These lunch debts reflect a failure in our system. The child should not have to go hungry because of this failure. Teachers often attempt to fill in the gap by providing snacks to hungry children. Why are teachers feeding children's stomachs when they should be feeding their minds? By providing school meals at no cost to all students, Maryland would be supporting equity in the classroom and making sure every child has the nutrition they need in order to excel. When a parent drops off their kid at schools or waves to them goodbye on, on their doorstep, they should be confident that their child will be taken care of body, mind, and soul until they come home. Therefore, the Free State PTA urges a, a favorable report on SB 557. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Allison Wade. I am a student with the Public Health Law Clinic at the University of Maryland School of Law. I'm here to discuss two topics. One, how this bill would expand on current state and federal school breakfast and lunch programs and two, how this bill would align Maryland with other states. First, under current Maryland law, public schools are required to administer free school breakfast and lunch programs, and nonprofit private schools can opt to participate. Participating schools are required to provide free breakfast and lunch both to students eligible for free meals and to students eligible for reduced price meals under the federal school breakfast and national school lunch programs. This bill would require participating schools to provide free meals to all students, regardless of their eligibility status. The bill also ensures that state funding will be used only to the extent that federal funding is not already reimbursing the schools. Second, by adopting this bill, Maryland can join a number of other states that have already adopted similar near universal school meal policies. Colorado, California, and Maine have already adopted such laws, and the Minnesota House is on its way. It just passed a universal school meal bill a couple weeks ago. Nevada, Massachusetts, and Vermont have all extended universal school meals at least for the 2022 to 23 school year, with the seemingly the purpose to try to determine how they can make these policies permanent in the future. 
Maryland should join these states that recognize the importance of feeding as many of our students as possible. This bill would feed nearly an additional half a million students in the states, in this state, and the benefit would expand across every county. To give a few examples, in Cecil County Public Schools, it would feed 9,000 additional students. In Baltimore County, it would feed 50,000. And in Frederick County, it would serve 33,000. I encourage anyone interested to reach out for data specific to your county. Thank you for your time. I urge a favorable report. Thank you. Questions, uh, Senator Stalling? No, I plan on doing that, reaching out to my county, because I want to see how many students are getting breakfast or lunch. Um, it's a concern to me, and I think it's a concern to everybody, not just in this committee, but in other committees and parents and student mothers and fathers, and I can go on. Um, I go to missions, and I see men and women and, and with kids, and they're hungry, and all they want is something to eat. That's all. And they, there's a lot of missions, in, and I go to Baltimore City and other places where they have that. But it breaks my heart when I find out how our young people, our future, uh, they come to school hungry. Uh, at my church, we pick up kids. We have five buses, and we feed them breakfast, and we give them lunch before they go because that's just the heart of a person. And I would love to have our state to have a great heart to reach out to our kids and to do great for them and make sure that when they get to school, they're not hungry anymore. And when they go home, they're not hungry either. And if we could do something like that, I'm, I appreciate the, the chairman and his bill. This is a very good bill. And I think we should do something for our kids. And I just want to tell you, thank you. Thank you. Very good. Senator Hedelman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just want to say thank you so much to Dr. Gross, who's a constituent and I know has been spent her career studying this. Uh, you have put scientific evidence on what we all sort of know in our guts, uh, literally and figuratively. But um, so I just thank you. And I think, are you a constituent also, Julia? No. Okay. Okay. But your parents. <laughs> thank you. Really important bill. <clears throat> very good. Uh, Senator Benson. I'm going to speak real quick. Uh, as many of you all in this room know, I'm an educator. Uh, I've taught every grade except for kindergarten. I was a principal, supervisor, you name it, I did it. Uh, when we first started out uh, my, my teaching career, uh, we gave the children milk. That's all they had. They came in, we gave them milk. But then we said, that's not enough. The educators of Teachers associate, that's not enough for, for some of these children. Mm -hmm. So we've we've seen we've seen the change. But when I became a principal, I remember, look, I said, call my staff together. What, what, I mean, I'm trying to think of the role of the principal in a lot of these schools. I brought my staff together, brought the cafeteria workers together, everybody together. If the child comes in this building and needs to eat, feed that baby child because I know what will happen if we don't feed that baby child. Test scores up in the air. Everything's going well. Some of those baby children, the only place where they could find a decent meal was at the schoolhouse. I just can't understand why we, why we don't get it. But I want you to know that I staunchly support this bill because I know what it means for our children. But at the same time, we've got to have more teachers and principals in schools that are sensitive to children who need to be fed. When the children are acting up, there's a reason. It, it, may, it, it may not be food, but it's something. I, I could talk about this all night long, but I'm not going to do that because I'm new to this committee. I'm trying to get along with everybody <laughs> when it comes to the education of our children. So I'm gonna to try to be nice and quiet and sweet and lovely. So thank you all so much for every single thing that you do <laughs> for children and for our school system. And I, I want to thank the Educators Association for all that they do. You all be abundantly blessed and I hope you have good health. And remember, let's keep on feeding our children. All right. Thank you, Senator. Okay. Um, is there, thank you all very much. Uh, is there anyone left in the audience who is favorable to this and would like to come testify? If you are, come on up. 
and then we'll move to the virtuals on this bill, and then we'll get to the next bill. Um, good evening, Mr. Chairman, committee members. I'm Willie Flowers of the NAACP uh, Maryland State Conference. Um, we come up this from uh, you know a, a civil rights standpoint, as you know the history of um, the NAACP and public schools. When the schools were segregated, um, one significant part of it, and I didn't know this, I didn't share in that experience, um, and I certainly give honor to everybody who did, but when they, uh, schools were segregated, one significant part of the school day was preparing the, the food for you know, numerous children. Um, and when the schools were um, desegregated and are, you know, are integrated, that shifted to another uh, mm -hmm. level because all of the funding didn't follow. So there were challenges with food still. And because of that, um, we honor the life of uh, Eddie Conway to this week because he passed away. He was a member of the Black Panther Party. And the Panthers um, created the breakfast program in urban areas. And because of that, it, it kind of forced public schools to increase equity in the food programs at, at public schools. And we know the history of that from the federal government. I share this to say that um, each time there has been an upheaval, there has been an advantage for folks, particularly free lunch students, who didn't have the ability to pay for their own food. And I see this as the same thing because we've heard these common commentaries about families who are happy not to have to pay anymore. These are middle-class families that are um, taking advantage of this now. And the story about the, the food that's thrown away, the food is thrown away because the food isn't, isn't quality. And so with this bill, it'll give an opportunity for middle-class families that it traditionally happens to increase the quality of food for everybody. So we stand by that, um, by the bill and, and encourage a favorable report so that equity is across the board, not just in access of the food, but also in the quality of food. So thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Ms. Flowers. Any questions for this witness? Okay, we're gonna move on to the favorable virtual, Ms. Cross. Hello, committee chairman, and thank you so much for everyone and the opportunity to speak on this bill. I am Mayor Kashina Cross from the city of Glen Arden, but I bring you greetings from the NAACP, the chairman for the youth works and the college programs. It is important that we acknowledge, as it has been said many times before, that a hungry child cannot learn. Parents each year is required to apply for free and reduced price school meals for their children. They are required to fill out forms and paperwork and waivers for access to free or reduced paid lunches. I just want the committee to know that as a parent, how much it is actually the cost that is required for every child. For breakfast, it is $1.60. It can be $2.75 to $3 a meal for lunch. Consider that we are bringing you greetings from Prince George's uh, County. And in Prince George's, nearly 13% of our children are living in poverty. We have the first call at 13.3% in accordance to the 2020 census. That equates to about 116,000 500 children who are living in poverty, down from 18% in 2019, but still not down enough. There are nearly 2,380 children who are living without food every single day in this county. It is important that we stand with and support the producers of this bill, that we have the right and the responsibility to ensure that every child gets a free meal. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the NAACP. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Yang Gerber, Garber, that killed that? <laughs> no, you didn't. <laughs> Yang Garber. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Fania Yangarver, Executive Director of Healthy School Food Maryland. I'm testifying in support of SB 557 on behalf of the over 6,000 parents whom we represent across Maryland and as a parent, nutritionist, and food policy advocate. 
I immigrated to this country as a child and qualified for free hot meals at school, which though not quite what I was used to eating at home, made me feel cared for and helped my family get on its feet while we built a new life here. School meal participation benefits students, schools, and the Maryland food system. Because of the care taken to draft this legislation, incorporating lessons learned from legislation passed in California, Colorado, and Maine, and efforts underway in over 20 other states, this bill emphasizes capturing maximum federal dollars and putting that money to good use across the state. Every meal served qualifies for some federal reimbursement and an upfront investment in gathering accurate data about household income levels will ensure that all the federal meal and education benefits our children are entitled to continue to accrue to the state. Furthermore, there are many untapped opportunities for Maryland farmers and other local food businesses to become more engaged in the school meal program. The pandemic has taught us that a resilient food system is one that is diversified and adaptable, but also primarily local. When COVID disrupted transportation networks causing shortages across the food supply chain and supermarkets were struggling to stock milk for the public, local dairies like Frederick's Dairy Made Dairy in business since 1894 continue to supply milk for school children. Expanding participation in school meals programs translates to expanding business opportunities for Maryland's food producers. Providing school meals at no cost to any student who wants one in the state is a smart investment in Maryland community. Thank you for hearing my testimony and I urge you to provide a favorable report on SB 577. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Uh, Ganesh. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Amparna Ganesh, a Richard Montgomery High School junior in Montgomery County Public Schools. I would like to start off by thanking the Budget and Taxation Committee for your consideration of this testimony. I understand it has been a long day, but this bill is vital for the well-being of our students across Maryland schools. Serving free meals isn't just about getting one person fed right, it's about the larger idea. An entire community now being able to thrive as the burden of feeding their children breakfast and lunch is uplifted. Students are expected to have more than a handful of responsibilities, and obtaining a healthy meal should not be one of them. Senate Bill 557 allows our school system to reflect the equal opportunity that we strive to serve families in Maryland. You cannot expect a student to get through their studies while trying to focus on their hunger as well. A staggering 200,000 children are food insecure, a truly devastating number. But what we saw during the pandemic allowed us to see a future with change, a future that can be made by enacting this bill. We saw a substantial decrease in food insecurity risk in families that were able to get access to food for their children so easily. Registrations or forms. They just were offered food and they were able to get it. The students part of our school system deserve the nutritious food they need to get through the day. Numerous studies have shown that students perform better when they aren't hungry and when they aren't balancing the issue of no food in their stomachs that a student have access to healthy food when they have to get through a seven hour long school day, plus other commitments. Imagine having to sit through seven or eight classes while also being hungry and not having a nutritious meal. The baseline is that obtaining a healthy meal should be the least of a student's worry, and it is our job to keep it that way. Thank you, and I hope you take this into consideration. Thank you so much. Yep, terrific. <clears throat> Uh, do we have anybody else? Okay. All right. Is Ms. Cross still on? Ms. Cross still on? No. Okay. I just want to note, I saw that Ms. Cross was also uh, on uh, a favorable on the next bill, too. So. Oh, she's going to wait for the next bill. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, I believe that is it for that bill. I think we got everybody. Is that right? All right. Very good. Uh, thank you all very much for your testimony on that. And now we'll move on to 559 and panel can come on up. Those, anyone who is here in favor of this bill is welcome to come forward. <clears throat> um, 
This bill has a little more limited scope, but yet a very important part of the scope. Uh, there, there's a program that exists where um, mm, um, not one, not 100 percent of the high poverty schools are actually getting the full benefit of this program. Um, anyone who wants to kick it off, kick it off. I'll start. Good afternoon, Chairman. Um, that my name is Aisha Holmes, and I am the State Director for No Kid Hungry in Maryland. I'm here today to register support for Senate Bill 559, <laughs> Maryland Meals for Achievement. As proposed, there is an increase needed of $4.5 million to schools that have at least 40% or more students that would qualify for free and reduced price meals. This increase of 4.5 million would add 120 schools at a time when families across the state are struggling with food insecurity. The Maryland Food Bank's food insecurity report in June of 2022 said that roughly 50% of families making less than $35,000 a year are food insecure. When considering all income levels, almost 20% of families are facing food insecurity. This data tells us that children in Maryland are at risk of facing hunger now. Childhood hunger is a solvable problem and investments like Maryland Meals for Achievement play a critical role in reducing food insecurity for our children. The policies outlined in Senate Bill 559 MMFA, it shows that it's an important tool with a 24 year track record for proving maximization in school breakfast. Nearly 64% of students in MMFA schools participate in breakfast as compared to 31 in student, 31 percent of students in non-participating schools. We know that breakfast after the bell demonstrates better educational performance, improved health outcomes, and a decrease in disciplinary needs. In closing, we encourage this committee to favorably report out on SB 0559. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for this opportunity to offer testimony on this legislation. Um, my name is Megana, and I am also a student, not a high school student, but a college student, actually. Um, I'm a student leader on my campus. I'm heavily involved with the Student Government Association um, at the University of Maryland College Park. And I am here to, on behalf of our entire SGA, request a favorable report on this piece of legislation. Um, something that I want to touch on, and I'll keep it brief, I know it's been a long day, is um, how achievement is connected to having meals, to not going hungry, um, and particularly in translating that to higher education. So um, the lovely high school students that we heard from earlier today, um, I was so excited to hear about their hopes and dreams of going to Georgetown and NYU um, and pursuing higher education like I'm doing myself. Um, and it really made me think about the students that I find myself surrounded by um, and I want students to know that they deserve to eat, you know, they deserve to have breakfast. And when they find themselves in a point in their life where they're living on their own, living independently, um, they're maybe in a situation in college where it's even more on them to go get food that they deserve to eat. And so part of that and something that's really important to me is building that habit early and teaching them in their K through 12 education that they deserve to have breakfast, they deserve to have food and not have to go hungry throughout the day when they should be focusing on their education and their activities. So um, I just would like to say from the perspective of college students, we would love to see the next generation of college students um, nurtured and nourished in the way that many of us were. Um, and I would like to see that rate of students who don't have to go hungry be even higher. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Mr. Chair and members of the um, Budget and Taxation Committee, my name is Stephen Mandel. <clears throat> I'm the co-chair of the Critical Issues Forum, which is comprised of three synagogues in Montgomery County. And for almost 10 years now, we've been advocating for measures that address, decrease, and hopefully one day will eliminate food insecurity in Maryland. MMFA is a game changer. Is it a tool that the Maryland schools have used successfully for 25 years? to improve learning in many high poverty schools. But unfortunately, there are still too many schools left out because of budget constraints in the program. Fully funding this very cost-effective program would make free breakfast available to over 120 more schools. 
When Maryland established this innovative program in 1998, it hoped that by allowing high poverty schools to serve breakfast to all students in the classroom after the bell, participation school breakfast would increase. That is exactly what has occurred, leading to improved educational performance, student health, and better behavior. I and members of my group saw firsthand the benefits of MMFA when we attended an event at South Lake Elementary School in Gaithersburg, one of the poorest schools in Montgomery County. We were there to help South Lake celebrate their 20th anniversary of using MMFA at the school. We heard unanimous praise firsthand for the program from teachers and administrators at the school. We saw students agreeably eating a nutritious breakfast in their classroom, often while they participate in an educational activity run by the teacher. But here's what I remember best about that occasion. The principal at the school noted to me that in 1998, before MMFA came, many children came to school late and immediately went to the nurse's office. After MMFA, that changed. Children went into the classroom. We know a substantial number of children do not eat breakfast at home. This would change with MMFA. The morning meal makes a difference. I'd ask this committee for a favorable report on SB 559, and thank you. Thank you very much. See an old friend now. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Lori Taylor Mitchell, president of the Student Support Network, a nonprofit assisting students in poverty in Baltimore County Public Schools. I'm here to urge your support for Senate Bill 559, funding for Maryland Meals for Achievement, or MMFA. Our network staff and volunteers work hard every day to achieve our vision that every student has the materials, nutrition, and peace of mind they need to learn. Unfortunately, many students arrive at school without having had breakfast. Students in schools participating in MMFA are offered universal free breakfast in the classroom, as has been mentioned, but at schools without MFA. Students with no access to breakfast where they live, who cannot get to school in time for breakfast in the cafeteria before school starts or whose bus is late, cannot get breakfast after the bell. Owings Mills High School in Baltimore County, a school with a 65% farms rate, is one of the many schools in Baltimore County eligible for MMFA, but does not have it. At that school alone, over 1,200 students could benefit from MMFA. All students need a healthy breakfast to start the day ready to learn. School systems need state leadership and funding as a part of a systemic plan to address student poverty and food insecurity on a statewide scale. Full funding for MMFA would benefit tens of thousands of children in poverty, including the thousands and families earning too much to qualify for food assistance, but not enough to make ends meet. This bill's impact would be even greater if the farm's eligibility threshold was lowered or eliminated altogether. For example, Delaney High School has a farm's rate of 33% and does not qualify for MMFA, but that percentage includes more than 600 students living in severe poverty. These students need MMFA too. As work on this bill progresses, I hope that breakfast will be understood as so critical to academic success that MMFA would be provided in all schools. Full funding for the schools eligible at the 40% farms threshold is a great start, but given the proven success of MMFA, why not offer it to all students? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee for the opportunity to speak. Once again, my name is Julia Gross. I'm here on behalf of Maryland Hunger Solutions in support of fully funding MMFA, uh, which is a longstanding state funded program that allows high poverty schools to serve breakfast after the bell. Um, and you have already heard from a number of panelists today about the benefits of school meals, so I won't repeat what has already been said. Um, but unfortunately, despite those benefits, a lot of students are missing out on the most important meal of the day, school breakfast. Um, and you've heard a lot about the barrier of cost, so I'm going to focus on the barrier of timing, which Maryland Meals for Achievement is uniquely designed to uh, focus on and address through breakfast after the bell service models. Um, and I can tell you from firsthand experience as someone who grew up in a rural county uh, relying on the school bus system and uh, carpooling groups that some students, a lot of students actually can't um, and don't make it to school on time and early enough to get access to a full meal at the beginning of the day. Um, one of the biggest challenges for school breakfast participation is that it's often served in the cafeteria 
before the start of the school day. And I can tell you that a lot of families juggling with work schedules, multiple school schedules are having the same issues of getting to school on time to be able to access this really important meal. Um, so Maryland Meals for Achievement is one of uh, the best ways that our state has put in place to make sure that that is addressed in schools that are eligible, high poverty schools with a 40% or higher farms rate. Um, they serve um, school breakfast in the classroom. They serve it in grab and go kiosk styles. They serve it after the bell in a uh, second chance um, style. All of these are proven ways and best practices to make sure that this meal has, uh, that students have equitable access to this meal. Um, and for these reasons that we are supportive of this longstanding successful, well-loved and proven program. And we respectfully urge a favorable report. Thank you all very much. Any questions for this panel? <clears throat> Senator Hedelman. Chairman, um, uh, first of all, thank you all for being here. And Laurie, especially, thank you so much for your efforts to Student Support Network and the impact that you're having on students throughout Baltimore County. I, I want to follow up on your idea about following the child, which is kind of what we have done through the blueprint, um, following having the aid follow for children as opposed to schools. And just ask you to elaborate on that more um, and how many, what, what assessment would you use um, to identify four kids and how much, how many more kids would you think would be included? Well, I, I think um, the 40% threshold is, you know, that's where people start, that's where the program started. But I think the, the issue is, is, as has been said many times, is that many families make too much um, to qualify, or, but not enough to make ends meet. 40% of all Baltimore County families are struggling economically. 73,000, and that doesn't, that, the 73,000 that qualify for free and reduced price meals, that's 73,000 kids, but the rest of them are invisible in the statistics. So I think the poverty rate is much higher than what, it, free and reduced price meals, you know, indicates. So that's why I think that's probably on a grand scale. Yes. But if, if, if it was offered, if it was offered after the bell in all schools, it's always been a compliment to, um, to um, CEP, right? CEP and MMFA often operate in, in, in the same school because the brilliance of MMFA is because of those kids can get breakfast outside of the cafeteria. And that's why they're such a great they're such a great compliment. And that's why I, I think ideally MMFA should be offered in all schools, really. Thank you. Senator Siling. Um, so I, I I was here, I hear what you're saying that how school, uh, I think it was always Mills, you were saying mm -hmm. that has the trouble of because of the time, and you were talking about timing. And I and I'm I was trying to get what you were saying, but can you help me out here again? Because I'm trying to find out why, you know, there's still some that are out there that can get it in their class, like you were saying, or get it, but still other schools aren't getting it. Are you saying like there's different programs and, and that's, a, that's one of the problems because of the timing? Well, um, 306 schools, according to what um, No Kid Hungry put together, 306 schools in, in the state don't are not funded with but through our MFA MMFA funding is not available to them and it's it's over 30 it's probably now with the higher numbers it's over 20 schools in Baltimore County qualify but MMFA funding has been flat which is why this is such an important bill to increase MMFA funding so for example Owings Mills has a farms rate of 65 percent that's 25 percent higher than what this program's threshold is now but they've never been funded for MMFA all those schools that that did not get funding requested it through BC, BCPS requested it last year and none of them got it. So that's why it's, this program is so important to at least get us that high. Thank you. Thank you. And if Thank I you. could just add one other thing, I think uh, for Senator Hedelman, um, I think that one of the ways to really think about poverty differently is to look at the United Way's ALICE report. Um, if we start to look at ALICE numbers, as a way to help us understand how people are struggling and living, um, I think we really start to lift boats, really lift boats out. Thank you for indulging me. Very good. 
Thank you all very much. Is there anyone here in person who would like to testify in favor of this bill that's left out there? Okay. <clears throat> who do we have in the virtual world? Ms. Cross is back again. Good to see you so quickly. Thank you, Chairman. It's wonderful to be back again. And what an amazing bill to testify. Let me just say thank you so much for the presenters of this bill that we do need to, in fact, have a Maryland Mills in-classroom breakfast program. I am the proud parent of two Prince Georgians, one in the fifth grade and one in the ninth. And she has reported to me just two seconds ago in hearing this message that there is several of her young friends who come off of the school bus late, which means they don't eat. And if they are at or below the poverty line, the numbers which I have already provided you, then you're looking at children who didn't start the day off well. It is so important that we ensure breakfast, the most important meal of the day is provided to every child. Hunger and obesity, those things are the byproducts of non eating children for breakfast. Across our county, from the NAACP Prince George's, 13.3% of our children or youth are living at the poverty line. That's 116,500. 100 children, we are imploring you to please accept the Maryland Meal Achievement in Classroom Breakfast Program favorably. It's so important for our children. Breakfast is the most important meal. Researchers have shown that breakfast is high in protein and healthy fats that allow our children to study and learn well. It is the most important meal because it also can also prevent certain illnesses from developing in the body as well. So thank you so much, Chairman, to all those presenting. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak in favor. Thank you so much. And thank you for your enthusiasm. Uh, any questions for the witness? Okay. Well, believe it or not, I think we did it. Um, five hours, just under five hours. Um, we got through 21 bills, we actually even passed one of them along the way. Um, and uh, uh, thank uh, the committee members, uh, particularly the ones who are hang out, still here. Y'all get a gold star. And uh, th 